This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to a beautiful day in South Africa. The sun is shining and it is nice and warm and as you can see there are some big grey animals that are moving through the thickets. It really is a beautiful day. Now it is a very very warm welcome to the school that is joining us this afternoon. So Jonesville Middle School, it's very good to have you all with us. Hopefully that you are going to love your experience as we take you through the African wilderness for the next 45 minutes. Now you can ask lots of questions and you'll be able to do that if you just give them to your teacher and your teacher will send them through to us. Now I don't want to be rude, I have to introduce myself as well. My name is Tristan and on camera I've got David this afternoon and what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and get closer to those Ellies because they're a little bit shy but there is a really really small baby elephant that is there. Now I I haven't seen a shy herd of elephants like these guys in a very long time and it's interesting because most of our Ellies around this area are very used to people and cars and they don't really worry about us at all but when you get elephants that sometimes come from quite far away these elephants might even be coming from as far as Mozambique which is another country and they might have come out of that area and that's why they're a little bit shy they don't really know the vehicles that well and that's why they're kind of trying to move off a little bit and try and find themselves a thicket in order to kind of sit and to hide away and to get out of the way of this big noisy vehicle that's around. So Caleb, that's a very interesting question. How long do elephants usually live in the wild? Well, Caleb, the elephants are very long-lived animal. They're much like us as people. They can live for a very, very long time. And so most of the time, the elephants will live probably around in this area because you see there's lots and lots of trees that we've got the Ellies will live to about 55 years sometimes as much as 60 in this area in some other parts of Africa Caleb where there's lots of grass you'll find that those Ellies can live a little bit older and can go as much as 70 years and if we had to put elephants in captivity and feed them a controlled diet they might even live as much as 90 so they can get very very old but where we are here in South Africa generally around 55 would be a good age for or an old age for an elephant now you can see most of the herd is there it's a very small herd so we've got a few females and their young ones and that's normally what you see with elephant herds is you normally see there's the adult female or the matriarch and then she has a couple other females around her and they have all their little babies and that's how they move around the big boy elephants or dad elephants they don't stay a lot with these females they tend to move off on their own and they go and look around for food and they'll only come and join the females every now and then so most of the time it is females that you see in these kind of herds and what you'll see is that they're sitting in the shade at the moment and every now and then they'll move and when they move out of the shade you might notice that their ears are moving quite a bit now it's not because they're very angry with us or they want to hurt us or anything like that their ears are simply moving in order to try and keep them nice and cool i was saying that it's a warm day and being a big animal like an elephant they absorb a lot of heat and it makes them get hot quite quickly but they have a very clever system in their ears that helps to cool them down so what they have is they have a whole bunch of veins which has blood in them and it's on the back side of the ear and it's covered by a very thin layer of skin and so as they flap their ear so they're pulling air over those veins and it's cooling the blood in the veins down and that then cools their body down and they can cool their body better than any other animal by flapping their ears like that it's part of the reason why their ears are so so big is because they want to be able to cool themselves down in the hot African sun. They seem like they've relaxed a little bit, so I'm gonna try and see if we can get a little bit closer to show you the tiny little baby, because there is a tiny, 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 tiny baby that is here, and I really want to show you this little one. It is very cute. But in the meantime, while I get closer, I'm gonna send you across to my friend, Steve, who's up in another country all the way in Kenya, and he wants to say good afternoon to all of you. Have you ever found lions here? Magoro, eh? Marsh Pratt. Well, 
Sorry, Steve seems to have a little bit of a problem. He couldn't hear Emma, who's the one that is talking to us in our ear and telling us all the questions that we have. But we've gotten a little bit closer to the Ellies. Not as close as we can sometimes get to some of the herds, but they're starting to relax. And you can see the little tiny baby on the bottom right of the screen. Isn't that cool? So that's a tiny newborn elephant that can only be a couple of weeks old maximum. It's really not very old at all. And so when they live for 55 years, they start out at that size. And so I would say that that one is probably maybe if the most a month old so it's still very new a little bit wobbly on its legs still and it will still have to drink from its mom and stay close to its mom and that's maybe why this herd was a little bit shy with us earlier is that they probably have this little baby that they're wanting to protect you can see how the little baby is in amongst all of those adults and the adults are trying to just keep it nice and safe there they're also going to be providing shade for that little baby because that baby is sensitive to the sun and so its ears in particular they can get sunburned so I don't know if you've all been in the sun for too long and you get sunburned it's not very comfortable at all it hurts a lot when your skin is sore like that and so with a little baby elephant their ears get like that and so they don't like it at all and it's not very comfortable and so mom provides the perfect shade and so she'll find that she'll stand there and the Ellie will normally stand little baby will just stand on the opposite side of mom from where the sun is and use the shade to stay nice and cool and to keep the sun off it but Look how small it is in comparison to its mom. It looks like its mom is that really big elephant. It is very, very cute. Now, I think that in all likelihood, they're actually going to stay right where they are. They found themselves some shade, and I think that's where they're going to actually feed for a while. So, Willow, yes, I have seen baby animals attacked, unfortunately. There are animals out here that have to eat meat. So things like lions and leopards, they often have to go after meat to be able to feed. And so they do attack baby animals because baby animals are very much, they make it a lot easier for those predators to go after. So it makes it easy to hunt them as opposed to hunting the adults because the adults generally are quite strong and quite big and it makes it a lot harder to hunt them. And so sometimes the predators do. And we don't interfere because out here in nature, as much as the elephants have to eat grass and eat leaves, so the, the predators also have to eat, otherwise they don't live. And we like to see things like lions and leopards and, and they are an important part of this whole ecosystem because without them, you'll find things like the antelope, so things like an impala maybe, their numbers will get out of control. There'll be too many impalas and they'll eat too much grass or too many leaves and that will cause a lot of other animals to die. And so there needs to be a balance and predators perform that balance by hunting sometimes baby animals, sometimes adult animals, but mostly they can target babies because it's much easier for them to hunt. And so a lot of baby animals do get killed out here and, and it's not only from predators, but also there's things like when it gets too cold too quickly, the animal might die or if it goes from too cold to too hot, sometimes the animal goes into shock. But what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and sneak forward a little bit more just so I can show you exactly how beautiful these ellies are. They look like they've calmed down quite a bit now and so they should allow us to get fairly close to them where we can get a much better view of what they look like. What I'm trying to do is just use a little road that we've got here so that we don't actually end up making too much noise because I don't think the Ellies want us to really drive over too many trees and those kind of things that might just make them a little bit more shy. Now it's important with elephants is because they're so big they can sometimes be quite dangerous and so what you have to do with Ellies is always watch their body. Oh the little baby's sleeping. This is so cool. We're going to try get a little closer so I can show you. But the little baby was having a nap. Oh no, it stood up. I'm sorry, little one. So the little baby was just having a bit of a nap. I think if we turn off and we quiet for a little bit of time, it might lie down again. You can see it's just there next to its mom. And so it was lying down on the ground. When they little like this, they get tired very easily because the herd walks too much, especially now in the winter. It's very dry and they need water and so they have to walk a long distance for water. And so it gets tired and it has to lie down. The adults don't lie down very much at all because it's very difficult for them to get up. But babies, well, they need to be able to lie down in order to get a bit of a rest. But there we go. Look at that. Isn't that sweet? That's very, very cute. Right, now our little baby is up and moving. Maybe it will fall asleep again. We'll stay and wait and hope that it does. And in the meantime, let's send you back to Steve again so he can actually say good afternoon. It sounds like he's fixed his technical gremlins.
Good afternoon, boys and girls. Welcome to Kenya and the Mara Triangle. My name is Steve, and I'm joined on camera by James, and we are in the Masai Mara. Mara Triangle which is up in Kenya four countries north of South Africa and we could just have a look in front of us as far as the eye can see is just vast wilderness there in the distance you can see that tree line that is in fact the marvelous Mara River that is running all the way through Kenya all the way down to Lake Victoria and that is what provides an enormous spectacle that we have here every year it's just passed, but we still have remnants of it, the migration of wildebeest and zebra. So we're going to go out this afternoon and see what we can find. It is a marvelous afternoon up here in Kenya. It's 30 degrees Celsius. It's about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. It is a nice and warm afternoon. I wish I had some air conditioning behind my ears like the elephants do. Please send through your questions with your teacher and let us know how we can help you out. Dad, can you know how many miles we cover in a day? It really depends. Uh, this morning I've traveled quite far. I would say I probably covered about 25 or 30 miles. I'm not actually sure. James, what do you think? How often? How much? James has been here longer than me. How much, Jay? About 40 kilometers, so about 20 miles or so we can cover. It really depends on where we go and how far we want to go. The Masai Mara is a very, very big area. So if we want to get anywhere, we've got to drive and we're going to go find some animals. But the beautiful thing about these open landscapes, and I'm going to show you right now, is that James can actually zoom in from a very long distance onto some zebra that we have just down here on the right-hand side. The road is a bit bumpy, so forgive us there. I'm just going to zoom in. Have a look how fantastic this is. There we go. There we have some zebra feeding on the very marshy area. I told you before that there's the trees in the background, the rivers on the other side. So the, the grass is very green because that whole area flooded. Justin, you want to know what's the average temperature here? Well, it's pretty much around 25 degrees Celsius, probably close to about 75, 80 degrees Fahrenheit during the daytime. And the nighttime can go down a little bit. I'm quite new to the Masai Mara, um, spending most of my time down in South Africa. But the temperature doesn't fluctuate too much up here. Up here we are pretty much close to the equator. So the temperature is pretty standard in the daytime and the nighttime. Whereas in South Africa, the huge summer and winter sort of time. So um, the temperatures do fluctuate with regards to time, night and day. Sorry, I just have a car pulling up behind me. I'm just going to move out of the way. This is an open reserve and people are driving through in their own vehicles or with guides. So you will probably see a couple of vehicles driving past. Here comes one now. And here we have the Masai Mara. Good afternoon, folks. So I'm just live for the moment. Hey, we'll chat just now. Okay. You on your way? Cool. So please send through your questions and comments through with your teacher. Sorry about that. It's difficult to have traffic in the middle of the wilderness. It's something I'm still getting quite used to. Down in Juma in the Sabi Sands, we don't get anything quite like that. But I just love the open spaces, the distance between us and the animals. And with this nice camera, you can actually see from very far away. So when the sun is shining and it's, when it's very hot days from a distance, what you need to do is look at the trees in the far, far distance. And that is where you'll often find lions and cheetah hiding up underneath the trees because they don't like the sun very much. They want to stay nice and cool. So we're going to see if from distance we can find any of these beautiful animals. But for now, we've got the zebra that are enjoying the grass there. I mentioned before that the river, when it floods, it often comes over onto that area. It's very marshy. If you walked in there past the zebra, you would get very, very stuck. There'd be no chance of getting out without a very, very big elephant to pull you out of there. But we're going to slowly make our way over there and see what else we can find there. That looks like a topi in the middle of the screen. It's also busy feeding on the grass. How fantastic is that? Everybody wants to say hello today, it seems. 
Okay, well, as we move closer and closer towards the marsh, let's go back down to South Africa with my good friend Tristan, who is still with his elephant. Well, Steve, I'm sure as you move towards the marsh, you might find some elephants of your own. I know exactly where Steve is going, and the marsh is obviously a good place for Ellie's. They like to go there in the afternoons. There's lots of water, and there's also a good area to find a nice grass to eat. And the elephants in the Maasai Mara look a little bit different to our elephants down here. Our elephants down here tend to have much smaller tusks on the female. So you see all of these uh, elephants that we've seen, their tusks are not very long. They don't have big, long tusks that you sometimes know. And that's because of the environment that they live in is one where they use their tusks quite regularly. So what you see with the tusks here is they are generally very, very thick. And you saw with that elephant now how it uses it to break that branch. And so because they use it all the time, it often gets worn towards the ends. And so that ends up making them shorter and thicker rather than the much longer tusks that the elephants in the Maasai Mara use because they tend to eat more grass than anything else. But we've managed to get a little bit closer to this herd. They moved towards some shade and so we've just parked kind of in the area where we think they're going to walk past and I'm hoping that they're going to kind of move roughly towards us. You can see they're all feeding at the moment and this is a typical time of day that elephants will feed. You find that they have a very bad digestive system which means that they've got to eat pretty much all day long they have a big big body as you can see and so they need to eat a huge amount of food in order to stay alive and so they have to spend probably most of their day actually looking for food and, and they'll go from grass to trees and roots and bark and all kinds of things oh so class how far will an ellie walk in a day well it depends it depends on many things now in the winter times the ellies are moving a lot more than they will in the summer in summer when we have lots of rain and the bush is very green and there's lots of leaves and flowers and water the elephants don't have to go very far but now in winter water is very far apart and so the elephants can easily do 30 40 miles in a day sometimes even more so there's been recorded cases of elephants going over 100 miles in a single day which is a a long long walk imagine having to walk that far it would be a, a really long day to get that far but they do do it they'll walk from the start of the day all the way through the night if they have to try and get water but generally their movements are between sort of I would say 20 and 30 miles a day in the winter and in the summer sometimes not even as much as five miles it just depends what food is available now that elephant that's closest to us you can see it's got its trunk up at the moment and that's because it's trying to feed off a tree that's got lots of spiny thorns which make it very difficult to actually eat and so it's being a bit delicate about it while it does it and that's a little boy elephant that's still quite young anyway talking about water and elephants having to move towards water there is another member of our team that is out and about and she's gone to one of the biggest water points that we have here in south africa and i wonder if there's any eddies that are going to go drink on that side The amazing thing about a Chitwa Chitwa Dam, Tristan, is that there's always something for us to find. And at the moment, we're looking at some hippos and then a big bird, which is called a saddle-billed stork. And they're really, really epic birds to see, and I'm hoping we're going to see it catch a fish. Good afternoon to all of you at Jonesville Middle School. My name is Taylor, and on camera with me today is Craig. You won't be able to see him, though. You just get to see his hands, and then he shows you all the most amazing, wonderful wildlife. Remember to ask your teachers. You're going to put your hands up really quickly. No shouting out loud, please. Um, if you want to know anything about all these wonderful animals. But that bird, look how deep it's... Well, I suppose for, for that stalk, it's not particularly deep because it's got very, very long legs. Now, there are lots and lots of birds that will be fishing in this dam. And uh, I think this is probably the biggest one of them all. And it has the most awesome fishing technique. See how it's kind of creeping closer to those hippos. Now, like I was saying, some of the smaller birds that fish, they don't have long enough legs to wade out in the middle. Some of them will swim though, but there aren't any of those today. And I think it's waiting for the fish that are maybe swimming between the hippos and where its feet are. And then it will quickly strike down into the water and spear any fish or even any baby crocodiles. Can you believe that this bird will be able to eat a baby crocodile? Now the hippos at the back, they're not interested in eating baby crocodiles or birds. They just like to eat grass. So that's what they'll do a little bit later today. But for now, they're just going to enjoy the afternoon in the water. 
Now, Jake, I wish my favorite I wish my favourite animal was here at Chitra Dan. They might, you never know, actually they might arrive. Um, so my favourite animal is elephants. Sadly we don't have any elephants to show you, Tristan had them. And the reason why I like them is because they're so entertaining to watch and I like to watch all, the, all of them interact with one another during their day. Now I'm trying to see what else there is. Craig, can you see the crocodile all the way on the other side? Look at that. See, there's a big crocodile. Now, that bird we were looking at won't be able to eat a croc of that size. And there's big crocs that live at Chitwa Chitwa Dam. And they normally spend most of their day out on the banks just sunning themselves, trying to keep nice and warm. So that's what those crocs are doing, just resting. They don't move around very much, kind of like tortoises and snakes and things like that. Especially when it's a little bit cooler. But today is quite nice, so they're charging their batteries. So they have to sit in the sun, did you know that? reptiles. They aren't like the hippos, they're not like the birds that can create or generate their own heat. Uh, reptiles have to get their heat from an external source. So when I say external source, they have to either sit on a warm rock or on the sandy banks and let the sun bake down on them. And that's why at night you sometimes see the snakes out in the middle of the road. It's because they're trying to keep warm even at night and the road seems to hold the heat a little bit better. So that's what they're doing. And those are all nests that you can see in that tree. And there's lots and lots of different animals that, or lots of birds that are actually living in all those nests. Most of them are buffalo weavers, but there's a few other birds that look like they've attached themselves. Right, off you go back to Kenya and Steve is driving around. Maybe you'll be lucky enough and he'll be able to find you a big African rock python in the marsh. Hello boys and girls, you're back with us up in the Maasai Mara. We're now off the main road, so the traffic, I think, will decrease. And there we have, yes, you know it, it is a warthog. And who can tell me what it is? Your first Swahili word, I'm sure everybody has seen the Lion King, will know exactly what that is called, because what they call that in the Lion King is in fact the name they call it up here in Swahili. Indeed, it is called Pumba, which is a warthog. And that looked like a female warthog. Had tusks like that. And that is to fight and also to protect themselves against cheetah, lion, and leopard. Because those tusks are very, very sharp. If the lion or leopard catches them, they can underneath and out comes your belly. Very, very painful. Well, she's not very relaxed. She's run off into the bushes. And we're going to continue on. Because in the distance, we can see some buffalo. So we're going to go over there and have a little look. Buffalo are always very exciting to see. They're always moving and doing something. If it's in an oopsie, very bumpy road, I do apologize. Hold on very tightly. If any of you have been on safari before, one of the most important rules is to hold on. Hello, David. You want to know what the fastest animal in Africa is? Well, the fastest Africa animal, mammal in the world, in fact, is the cheetah. And hopefully we'll be able to find you one. They can get up to 110 kilometers an hour, so a speed of about 50-odd, 55, somewhere around there, miles an hour. Very, very fast. And there's absolutely no chance you'd be able to keep up with them. One of our very popular sports stars in South Africa quite a few years ago he's very fast if you you probably don't know rugby but you know American football one of those receivers the guys are really fast running down the line imagine the fastest guy you know he decided to race a cheetah well it was quite a joke actually because the cheetah and him went the cheetah was already 200 yards away by the time he got halfway so yeah, it was quite a funny thing. I think it was all about advertising, but no chance of outrunning a cheetah. But just as well, because they're not really looking for people to snack on, looking for all the small antelope. Hello, Mia. I have not seen a cheetah physically attack any animal um, in the wild. Myself, personally, haven't spent too much time with cheetah, but up here, Scott and the other guys who've been working in before I arrived have seen the cheetah catching lots and lots of animals and there's a coalition so a group of boys up here I think there's five of them and they pull down wildebeest incredible incredible with all their strength and power together they're able to take down much bigger prey but on their own 
They'll only take smaller animals. And I'll try and find you a couple of them, smaller animals. Maybe we can even find you a cheetah as we just get around this little marshy area. We're coming up to a really big herd of buffalo. And now the cheetah wouldn't even dare going for the buffalo. And the buffalo can get up to about 2,000 pounds. And the cheetah, well, maybe 120. So there's just no, no chance, really. No chance. Well, I'm just going to get one more spot over here. How's this, James? Is that good? Yes. Okay, James is happy. He's got the camera. There's an enormous herd of Cape Buffalo here. They stretch for a couple hundred yards from left to right. And there they are. Regarded as one of the big five. I wonder if you've all heard of the big five before. That's a, a herd of buffalo. We're going to see if we can count them. There's babies and mummies and big old bulls. And we're going to get in amongst them. Get to grips with what's going on here. Maybe there'll be some lions following them. But in the meantime, let's go down to Taylor, who's still with a very rare bird. And I don't want to even move because since you've left us, it still hasn't caught a fish. It's tried to strike at the water two more times. Now, I suppose they're not the most accurate hunters but they are persistent, so that means that they will constantly keep trying. They don't take no for an answer. And I did see some big catfish moving around in the water in that channel. And I reckon that if we stay on it, we will probably catch it, uh, watch it catch something. And then it's really, really incredible to watch them try and eat it. The whole process is so amazing. See, look, it looks like it's seen something. They are standing still. You can also hear the hippos in the background, but it's a bit windy out here today. Now, I know that this is a, a male saddle-billed stork. And if you look very carefully, you can see just as he turns his head, he's got two little yellow wattles underneath his beak. So the girls don't have that, that's just for the boys. Otherwise, they look very much the same. And I don't know where his partner is. I don't know what happened to him. Maybe he just hasn't found a girlfriend yet or a wife. He's still looking. It's a good spot that he's here though, because with all this water around, and there's not many other dams that have as much water as Chitwa Chitwa Dam does. So it's a hot spot. So there should hopefully be a lot more of these birds around, but you don't actually see them very often. So that's why when we do see them, we try and spend as much time as we can, just because they're so fascinating. Now, they're quite a big bird. I mean, that bird stands at one and a half meters tall. And if it opens its wings all the way, its wings are wider than a doorway. How crazy is that? And you can see it's been spending a lot of time here. This is also apparently the luxury bathroom facilities. And that's all he's gonna do is he's gonna go round and round, walking in the water looking for more things to gobble up hopefully it'll be successful right i'm going to send you just a little bit further north from where i am back to my dear friend tristan well yes we are quite far north and we're looking at something that's very very cool to see because this is a footprint for my favorite animal now when we out here looking for a lot of the animals we have to try and do it by using footprints so some of the animals are not as big as the elephants and it makes it a lot harder to be able to find them and so how you have to do it is by using their tracks and this particular track that we're seeing here is a track for a leopard so this is a female leopard that we have here this is her back foot we know it's her back 
back foot because it's very very long so a back foot of a leopard will be much longer from back to front than it is from side to side and it was a female because of its size if you were to look at something like a lion which you maybe think you would confuse it with a lion would be a lot larger and if it was this size it would be a tiny cub that would be with a mom so there would be a mom that would be walking here and we don't see any sign of that so this is a female track that's been moving we know it's a cat straight away because at the back here I've got one lobe two lobes three lobes so that always tells you cat track and then on the toes they're nice and rounded and no claws on the front the thing that you could confuse this with would be something like a hyena which would only have two lobes and it would have claws that would be off on the front as would a cheetah as well so we know it's a leopard and this is her back foot then on the here is the front now if you look on the front foot I'm going to try and do a cool little trick for you so you can see what I mean about how much bigger the back foot I mean the front wider the front foot is than the back foot but I need a nice piece of grass to do it otherwise it's not gonna work let's try this piece here so what we're going to do is we're going to break a piece of grass for you to show you the difference in length so that's the length of the track and then we'll do the widest part over there which is like that okay and I'm going to put it onto the track here like that okay now you can see with this front foot the toes end right there so much 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 shorter than the back foot the back foot is a much longer foot than the front foot and then if you look at the width you see where the toes on the front foot are over the sides of the back foot so the back foot much longer front foot much wider and rounder and has that round appearance and it's really easy then to tell the difference between back and front on a leopard the other interesting thing is that this leopard wasn't by herself there was actually two leopards here the other leopard was moving over here this is a little female as well so this is her female cub that has been moving with her so the two of them actually walked here and they would have been together now generally with a leopard you normally kind of see them on their own um, unless they have cubs this female cub is about almost a year old now so she's quite big and her feet are almost the same size as mom these are slightly smaller than what her moms are now unfortunately for us I was always get excited when I see leopard tracks except that these tracks are not fresh and so when I talk about fresh I'm talking about tracks that have happened now that I can follow to be able to find this leopard unfortunately I know these tracks are from yesterday because I followed them yesterday and so I know that these aren't going to lead me to this particular animal she walked a long way from here and she's gone a very 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 far distance and so we won't be able to find her off these footprints but hopefully we can pick up fresher footprints and be able to find you a leopard at some point but very cool to see it's my favorite favorite animal so I always get excited when I see leopard tracks and then what we would do if we found these and they were fresh we would follow them along luckily often they use roads to walk and so you've kind of follow on the roads and then if you don't find them on the road then you can stop you look for the track and if the track goes in the bush then you follow it on foot and you try and find that animal somewhere there and generally you can spot them ahead of you then you come back and get the car and you can go and it can be sometimes a little bit dangerous you sometimes have to be a bit careful about the way that you do it but if you know what you're doing and you've done it for a few times and you kind of have experienced guides with you that teach you it can be quite a cool thing to do Surely difficult to say what the most dangerous animal is that we encounter. It depends in a vehicle or on foot. If we're in a car like this, an elephant is probably the most dangerous one to encounter. They are very big, they're very strong, they can throw this car very easily. Whereas on, on foot, I would say probably a hippo or a buffalo. If a hippo is out of the water or buffalo by itself, they can be really, really, really scary and they can be quite aggressive and charge at you and try and hurt you. So those would probably be the two hardest. You would think that the cats would be the ones that we'd be most afraid of. So you think things like lions and leopards would be terrifying to find, but actually they sometimes are quite nervous of us and quite scared and they generally will try and move away rather than be aggressive unless of course they've got cubs or they've got food that they're trying to protect. Right now it sounds like we're talking about buffalo and that they can be dangerous on foot. Luckily though in a car they're not too bad and my friend Steve, well, he's put himself right in the middle of a very large herd in the Masai Mara. Yes, well, these guys are pretty relaxed. Um, they are, as you all have told us, that you do know what a big five is. So 
your big five, as you know, being the five most dangerous animals to hunt on foot. So buffalo being on foot, they are potentially dangerous. But yes, we are in the safety and the confines of a vehicle. So you are pretty safe. But they are big and bulky animals and they have a temper to match. And what's going on here, you can see some are lying down and some are standing up. The swishing of the tails to keep away the flies. Then they feed on the grass. They're all in here in the long grass. And it's a big family, really. Lots and lots of males, lots of females, lots of babies. And they are very, very cool to spend time with because lions love to follow buffalo around, uh, especially down on the Sabi Sands. They really do like the buffalo there. Up here, there's lots of other animals to choose from as well. So the buffalo are eaten, uh, but they are very dangerous because you can see both the male and the female have got those horns. And there you can see the female just on the right of the screen. She has got the horns. They're quite shiny. She's busy chewing. You can see that one. But in the front of her head, you can see where the horns are. There's a little bit of hair. It's not very bulky there. That's how you easily identify a female. That's a female on the left as well. And all the way at the back, another female. So we call that the, the horn area there, the boss. So the females don't have a very well-defined boss. So there on the far left, you can just see the one on the left, and the one coming in on the right is a male. They're quite young males. Evan, you want to know what I, the hairiest animal I've ever seen? Wow, I'm going to have to think about that. Sure, that's a very good question. Well, the scrub hairs are pretty hairy. We find them down in South Africa. I'm sure we get certain types of hairs up here as well. Um... The, the hyena up here are pretty hairy. They're quite shaggy in their coats. And then the olive baboons that we find up here have also got an enormous amount of fur on them. They're very, very hairy guys. I'm trying to think who else. I'm sure Tristan and maybe Taylor might be able to show you a Nyala bull down in South Africa. That's probably the hairiest animal or mammal that I know of, the bull. They've got long, shaggy coats of fur chocolate brown with little streaks of white in it and beautiful long orange socks so that is my guess for now i wonder if tristan and taylor have got a hairiest animal to add for you but there you can see the two females she's busy chewing and there is a bird sitting on her back and another bird flying past the first bird on the back actually lives off of ticks on the buffalo so they help the buffalo in surviving because they remove the parasites from the body. There's another one jumping on the back there. Oh, that's a different species altogether. I don't know what that is. I can't really see. It's very far off. But the first one is an ox pecker, and hence the name ox on a cattle. And a buffalo are the only wild cattle-like animals in Africa. Anyway, I'm sure Taylor McCurdy down by Chitwa watering hole is going to be able to tell you who who her hairiest animal is. I'm going to go with Tristan. <laughs> I'm joking. I don't know who's the hairiest, but you asked me for the hairiest animal, and it could be a competition between Steve and Tristan. They've all got big beards. Um, I'm still trying to grow my beard. Anyways, so it's got a little bit quiet at the dam now. Uh, all the little hippos that are... In, the, in and amongst the adults there. They were playing just now, but now they've stopped playing. But I suppose they've also been very busy all day long. But I'm very curious all of a sudden, because as we're watching these animals, I'm hearing birds starting to alarm. And I don't know if there's maybe another bird of prey or something that's flying around that's scaring them. But it's hard to sort of say. Now, David, you've asked about the, the weight of a hippo and how big that they get. They get massive. So typically a female hippo will weigh anywhere between one and a half and just under two tons. And then a big male hippo can weigh a whole lot more than that, well over two tons. They get really, really, really big. They're very long as well. They don't look like they're big in the water, but that's, of course, because they're hiding away. But as soon as they come out of the water, you won't believe how long they are. They're so, so, so long and also very wide and they get big like that just from eating, just from eating grass. And so Betsy, they don't want to play for us now. It was really sweet when they were playing. There was one hippo that actually got out of the water and 
went over the damn wall. It's gone now. Should we go around the corner quickly? I see some, there's some more hippos. Let's go look down there. Let's see, bye stork. Our stork still hasn't caught anything in here now. This is also a great fishing spot. If I was gonna fish, I'd probably throw my line out here. Awesome, well, we might actually see if we can find that stalk again because the water is very shallow which means it's probably easier for it to catch some fish and uh, Tristan's not going to be doing any fishing where he is but you know you never know with Tristan Well you never know maybe I will just find somewhere to go fishing and take a fishing rod out maybe I'll take something like a piece of meat and we can go fishing for a leopard we won't do that. That won't happen. I'll be in trouble if I do that. I'll be told off for doing that. You can't feed the animals out here. It's important to remember that wild animals need to stay wild and so feeding them is not a good idea. But what we are doing is that we are trying to see if we can find a pride of lions at the moment and I'll tell you why we're trying to look for them because basically what happened is last night there was a big herd of buffalo like the ones you saw with Steve not quite as big as that but a biggish herd and the lions were chasing them around last night by the sounds of things by the looks of their tracks as well and so they chased them and then they ended up kind of disappearing this morning we couldn't find them anywhere but the buffalo herd came out of an area where we lost the lion tracks and so we think maybe just maybe the lions are somewhere close by and so what we're trying to do now is just trying to double check that the lions are not still around and maybe we can find some lions for all of you i think our leopards it's a little bit hot maybe for lion and leopard at the moment they'll only wake up a little bit later when the sun goes down but you never know maybe we can get lucky there's actually a water hole that's not too far away that i think maybe might have a lion or a leopard at it if it's hot enough they might have gone for water and they might be lying on the banks in the shade close to the water so we're going to go and have a little look there and we're going to see if we can get it right but with regards to steve and his hairiest animal i would say probably out here is a water buck that's probably the fluffiest hairiest animal that we get out here I would think other than maybe James Hendry who is a friend of mine who also works for us he's also quite hairy and fluffy <laughs> just not on his head <laughs> just everywhere else but anyway um, McLeod yes Louise said water buck and will agree with me Louise also works for us but McLeod, um, how long will cubs stay with their mom? Depends if we're talking about lions or leopards. If we're talking about a leopard, well, then it's about 14 months to two years that a mother will look after its cub before it has to go off on its own. If we're talking about lions, well, lion cubs, depending if they're male or female, if they're females, generally they stay part of the pride and for their life and they will just join their moms and the pride will get bigger. Unless, of course, the pride gets too big and they can't find food, then they might split off and they'll go and find their own areas as a group. But generally, they'll stay with the pride boys. The boys, they get kicked out at about three, three and a half years old by the bigger males in the area. So the lion's a little bit longer than a leopard. And leopards tend to be a little bit earlier. They get chased out and have to go and do their own thing. It works, though, for leopards because they're such elusive animals and they can be shy and they can really sneak around they like to kind of move off on their own and that helps them to be able to find the food that they need and even if they go off when they are young they can still hunt things like lizards and birds and those kind of things which means that they even if they're small and inexperienced they can still sometimes find the food that they need right now we're at the water hole that i was hoping we might find ourselves a lion or a leopard you never know you can always try and look around here we might might just get lucky and have one of them kind of in this area so we're just going to go nice and slowly as we go along check all the shady spots that are around because that's where any of the cats would like to lie and so i'll show you what the dam looks like it's getting quite dry now oh there's a hippo look there's a big hippo that's standing up so there we go look at that that's cool so this is a hippo that doesn't have a very big pond to lie in this dam is drying because it's so dry at the moment and so hot that the water is disappearing very quickly and this poor hippo really doesn't have much space and so he's probably stood up because he heard us coming and it's just to warn us that this is my pond don't come any closer you can see when he lies down the water is not even covering him which is not ideal he needs water really on his back and all over because otherwise his skin can get very sunburnt 
and he can dehydrate quite a bit. So the class, yes, I mean hippos spend a lot of time in water during the day. At night, not at all. So at night they come out and they will go and try and find food and they spend more time on on land at night. But during the day, 90% of their time is in water. So it just depends on and kind of time of the day. But I suppose it would probably be 60-40. 60% in the water, 40% out now. There's also a bird coming over, David. I don't know if you can get it for me while it just drifts past us. So there is a big, 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 big bird that is flying over. That is called a white-backed vulture. Now, white-backed vultures are birds that will scavenge and try and find meat. And so when we're looking for things like lions, particularly if they've maybe been chasing buffalo that is a bird that we want to keep a very close eye on because they if they land could indicate where there might be a kill or a carcass where the lions might be feeding so we want to pay attention to where those birds go and I'm actually just watching it now it looks like it might go into land let's see mm, yes it is landing so it's landing not too far away, but it's the only vulture there, which means that in all likelihood there isn't a meal. If there was a carcass, we would have a lot more vultures and there'd be lots of different species. So I'll just come and have a look there. We might go and just check around to make sure, but it looks as though it's just the one vulture, which means it might just be tired and is going to take a rest. Good. Well, while we scratch around and while we see what that vulture is up to, let's send you back across to my friend Steve in the Mara and I wonder where he's gone since he left those buffalo maybe he'll get more lucky than I am and be able to find a toothy lion to show all of you well welcome back we are still with our buffalo and they haven't moved very far most of them are starting to bed down for a few hours they've probably been feeding for a very long time and as I mentioned before they feed on grass just like cows do and then they like to sit down in that very popular position and then they chew and chew and chew. So they're basically, all the food they've been feeding on during the day, they will then regurgitate and re-chew and swallow. And it makes the digestion of that food all the much better. And so that's what they do now. And while they're doing it, they're actually resting. It's almost like they are meditating. Their brain power goes very, very low. It's all very automatic. And they're lying down so their body is resting and all they're going to do is just relax take it easy and spend a few hours here ruminating before the herd decides to get up and probably all walk off into the distance to go and drink again but thank you boys and girls from Jonesville Middle School thank you for joining us it has been a marvelous afternoon I hope to hear and see you all again uh, we'll be chatting to you next time you're on the show but feel free to join us again anytime you like for some African education and on that note we're going to say goodbye to you for now thank you very much for joining us Hello everybody, welcome to your normal afternoon a game drive safari with myself and James out in the Maasai Mara with our very happy looking buffalo. The last time I was in this area with Archie back in February I was quite scared to go anywhere really. The, the marsh, it was very very wet, very marshy and um, I at the time was the only guide to not get stuck and driving through it now today the clay is hard and it's quite bumpy quite hard um, I don't foresee us getting stuck at all but that's okay because I've got big James on the back who would be able to manhandle the vehicle directly out of any lugger or dugger or mud that we might get stuck in and please welcome back again uh, we are as you know in the Mara uh, sent through your questions hashtag Safari Live let us know what you'd like to do it is Monday after all and I have collected a couple of little samples that I found around my camp which we will get to in a short while because what do we do on Mondays? We do medicinal Mondays. And um, I'm just going to move out of the way here for this vehicle. It is medicinal Mondays, folks, but um, I don't know too much about the plants in Namara. But I have got at least some families here, and I found a couple of plants. I'm just going to discuss them 
give you a little bit of a while to breathe and to realize that it is actually in fact medicinal mondays and then i'm going to go into a little bit of an in-depth discussion of a couple of the plants and maybe some of you out there will actually be able to tell me the species name of them because i can only think of the one plant of a family or genus name uh, we do find a very similar plant down in south africa and one of the specimens or two of the specimens i've captured we actually find exactly the same down there so i don't have my pots and my pans unfortunately my domestic flight within kenya was quite limited with regards to what i could take as it was i actually was overweight anyway and had to pay a fee so that was bad anyway we'll get past the door it is a beautiful afternoon we have spent some time with our buffaloes we're now going to go to the other side of the marsh to follow up on whatever else is on that side so while we move around and get into a better position let's go back down to South Africa with Taylor McKady all right welcome back everybody welcome back now I have to show you something I first want to find a shady a shady tree because I don't feel like and then also at the moment I'm staring straight into it which is a nightmare so, we, so we're just gonna go down Mamba Road quickly in here and then hopefully, yep, I see, I think I see a tree that might be able to provide us with a bit of shade. So the reason why I'm, I'm going to stop and why I need to stop is, Tristan said to me today, and I thought I'd just share it with all of you. He says, you cannot say that, I don't, and that I'm not ever nice to you. I'll, I'll tell you why he says that. Because I was looking for a, a spare piece of equipment. So basically, here is a mic pack. Sorry, I'm holding it. I don't know how close you can get, but this mic pack basically. Now at the back is a little clip. And we've run out of these these clips. So Tristan had on his mic pack and he very kindly gave it to me this afternoon. So thank you very much, Tristan, for giving me this clip. It means the absolute world and you're such a generous, nice man. <laughs> Well, there we go. That's what Tristan did for me today. If any of you haven't done a good deed, be more like Tristan. What would Tristan do? <laughs> right. Let's carry on. Yeah, mic pack on again. Now we can continue our search. I think we're going to go back and try and scratch for Hosanna quickly. Emma, did you not enjoy? Oh, my earpiece came out. What did everyone say? What was the response? Or was there no, there was no response. Final control was quiet. They didn't like that story very much. Okay. It's fine. Understand. Are you getting, are you getting... Oh, oh. Emma's like Kirsten. She's, uh, she's fiery. There's two of them now. There's two fiery redheads in final control. I'm not sure who's got more sass because Emma's, she's close. She just said the reason why she was quiet is she was running to get some tissues because it was so emotional. <laughs> ah, hilarious. Okay, so I think we're going to go all the way down towards the Mulwati. We'll probably, we'll probably check, the, check the drainage line. I don't know where hosanna has gone because a massive troop of baboons had uh, fed through and obviously had a drink, I'd imagine, at uh, Twin Dams. And we all know that uh, leopards and uh, baboons have a love-hate relationship. So I think they probably chased him away. Oh no, you're joking. Is he re- Tristan? I already have to radio Tristan. Copy, who found them? Okay, copy, cool, good luck then. And then I'll, I'll just head straight in that direction. I won't um, bother too much with Hosanna. I'll just check the Mulwati. Here we go. So Tristan is following up on the, the leopard that we didn't see this morning but we saw its carcass in a tree at Buffelzook Dam. He says there's squirrels and all sorts of things going ballistic at the dam so that's exciting. Then 
Uh, I'm not going to follow up on Hosanna too much because it sounds like the Inkuhuma Pride have been found. How amazing is that? So Aubrey found them, one of the guides from Juma. He says they're somewhere up, I think between the Mvubu Road and Gauri Cutline. So where Tristan had the buffalo today. So we weren't far off, so they obviously followed them through. I don't know if they've got a kill, but we'll obviously find out in a little bit. We're probably about 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so away, because we will just bumble down here. I want to check Mamba Road because before everybody starts to drive it, if he has come up this way, then at least it's uh, it's a fairly sandy road, so I should be able to see his tracks. We probably will see the tracks from this morning where the lions crossed over. They've did some serious walking, like some serious traveling. Good for them. I hope they do have something to eat. Yeah, Kalinda, that was literally Tristan and I were just sort of missing them because Tristan was checking on just the other side of Gallego, Gallego Pan and, and Vuyatela, and he actually went, came to Vuyatela Dam, but he was just further west and sort of further south and then at one point he was further north of them and then I was to the far east, I mean we started off here down in the south track thing, we tracked them over Mumboro, they then went all the way, they crossed Batalia Road, they went to the drainage line up in Yala Road north, They were, some of them went on Central, so we, were, we basically just missed them. The only place we didn't see the lions actually cross directly there. There were just a couple more tracks on the road. And then there was another big male that, well, one of the young males that crossed there. And um, so we, we basically, there was like one section that we didn't get to because the drive wasn't long enough. But uh, I think we would have found them. So that's great news though that they have been found. I knew they were here. Epic. Okay, we're going to go down into the Mulwati now. So we'll just check for tracks here and then we'll see Tristan will probably if he doesn't pick up on that leopard that side it might be a skittish male maybe someone like Kojima he'll probably come down and keep checking this way right off you go back to Stivovo to see what is happening in the Mara Triangle We are indeed with some beautiful elephants and it is always so amazing to see them out in these plains with the small forested areas behind them. Busy feeding on the grass. As we see the elephants down in South Africa, they tend to choose a lot of the grasses there when the grasses are good. Only moving over to the trees when the grass obviously disappears and when all sorts of medical needs arise. They like to feed on vegetation from the leaves and the bark and the, the roots of course for all of the ailments that we've been discussing over the last few months. Really, really amazing. Elephants up here, majestic, very relaxed. More and more of them in the thickets there, possibly choosing to feed on a few vegetation or leaves or gra or, or barks this time of year. Soothe some tummies. And talking about the soothing of tummies. Seek Seek, I saw a pair of lions yesterday, two young males, and then again I saw uh, a mating pair. Uh, which I believe was Kinky Tail and one of the old Donya Payek males. We've been going at it for a whole week, can you believe it? They are very, must be very tired now. James and I went out on a bumble last night to just find our ways around. Not that James knows how to find his way around, I need to learn. So before the elephants get photobombed by a vehicle, we're going to come back to the car and quickly have a little discussion about this one plant that I have here, James, if you don't mind. Unfortunately, there's a very long zoom out and back in again, but seeing it's vehicles, we're going to enter the frame. I have got a beautiful tree over here, which um, I'm going to try and hold very still for James to, to get close up. And what you can see over here on this individual here is it's a trifoliate leaf. So, and the, the fruit, you can see that there's these little sort of well, these are the flowers at the moment, but they're going to form a very nice sort of what we call a droop 
the gods the fruit. And this is part of the Rus family. I don't know the species, but they're called Circeas these days, not Rus, Circea. And we get many, many, many Circeas in South Africa. And uh, the, the trifoliate leaf is very diagnostic of them with this sort of droop-like flower arrangement that leads to a whole lot of berries that are very, very edible for, for birds. And um, I was chatting with one of the Ascaris before coming out just to make sure because um, a lot of the Russes in South Africa, or should we call them Circeas, or should we call them Koreas? Because in South Africa, the name Kuri comes from actually the Khoisan word to mean, to mean honey or mead beer. And the Khoi Khoi, which were the Bushmen or the Khoisan people, used to make all sorts of decoctions out of these to make a sort of, not a decoction, but boiled up the fruits to make, or fermented the fruits to make a beer. And I asked the gentleman then, he said, yes, you can make a beer out of the fruits, but it's very, very sour. So a different type of uh, plant up here in the Mara, but quite similar. And he says cattle will actually choose this plant itself to settle any sort of tummy ailments that they might have. So whether we can use them or not up here to settle tummy ailments, I'm not sure, but I have no doubt the elephants would know. So if they probably came across a plant like this, surely they would enjoy it. But f the fruits are well, well eaten across Africa by all sorts of fruit eating birds. So a very, very useful plant. And the wood is actually quite tough and firm. You can make all sorts of implements, handles, and small tools, wooden spoons and those sort of things, cooking implements, very, very useful, rolling pins for the kitchen, small bits of furniture, so quite a useful tool, but they don't get very, very big that I know of. Uh, in the high felt in Johannesburg area, the Circes up there can get quite big and they were known to make fence, fence, fence posts which were termite resistant. So that is my spiel for the moment on the one Rus up here that I do not know the species name for. So if anybody could identify that from the brief visual that we had, please send through hashtag Safari Live. But in the meantime, we're going to move on. We see a whole lot of vehicles converging in the distance and uh, maybe there might be something special there. So let's go and have a look. But in the meantime, let's go all the way back down to Tristan and his activities. Well, we're sitting here at Buffelshoek Dam and we're very close to where Taylor had that carcass this morning. In fact, that's the tree where the carcass is hanging. And we came up here hoping that they would maybe be able to bump into something, but it seems as though there isn't really anything actually here at the moment. It seems as though there must be a leopard that is very shy and very skittish that's hanging around this area because basically what we got is as we got here, we just heard a squirrel start shouting and I think this leopard must have taken off around this drainage line or somewhere in this general area and is kind of hiding away from us. And so what I'm doing now is I've parked a little bit further away, as you can see by David kind of zooming out, and we're just sitting nice and still and quietly in the hope that maybe, just maybe, this leopard slowly slinks back towards its carcass. With shy, skittish leopards, and this is often the case, is that they can be a little bit nervous. So this could be Kojima, it could be maybe Mfukazi, it could be any of these leopards. We don't really know the tra track looks like for a male, so it might be one of them. And so what I'm doing is just hoping that they might just kind of sneak through somewhere. It's a nice elevated spot that we're in, and it's quite open for the most part. So if it walks anywhere towards this kind of area, then I'm generally sure that it will kind of be able to be visible and we will be able to see it but it's going to be a patience game unfortunately with these kind of things sometimes you have to be really patient and sit for long periods of time and wait and wait and wait and it's the only way to get things kind of sorted now you can actually hear in the distance there's a squirrel that's still going crazy at the moment and it really may may we still can see that particular leopard crystal it could be infokazi i mean he's, i don't think he's that skittish though not skittish enough to be complete ghost at this carcass taylor was here this morning i've been here now and this animal seems to be very shy so gajima would be my best bet also where we are would fit with the gajima mold he spends a lot of time in this particular section and he's been seen around this area before we know though if it is gajima and, and theoretically if it is any of the other leopards that this is a very very, very kind of um, well these animals are okay at night and so if we don't get much luckier after about 20 minutes or half an hour of sitting here then what we're gonna do is we're gonna carry on and we'll come back just as darkness descends and we'll park very far away now that we know exactly where the carcass is I wasn't too sure and I actually got a bit closer than I wanted to so what I'll try and do is just park quite far away and then just hope that maybe we get lucky and this leopard emerges out of the bush sometimes you've just got to be patient with these kind of things and it can be worth it particularly if it is a shy leopard you never know maybe even that skittish female is around 
too. So, you know, we'll just have to play it by ear. Either way, though, there's definitely a leopard that has dragged this, and the drag mark is miles. It goes for a long, long way, all the way along past Bifflesook Dam wall, uh, wall, the water edge, and then all the way into this drainage section. So it is a tough, tough animal to have dragged like that, and I would imagine that um, this animal must be quite a powerful one. So I really think that it would be a male. Well, I'm hoping that it's going to be a male. Like I said, the truck looks like a male, but I just don't see anything. I've been trying to scan all the shady spots that are far away because I'm 90% sure that this leopard is watching me as we speak. We just haven't managed to pick it up just yet. And we know leopards can be masters of disguise when they want to. You can see it's fairly open. So you would think if it's on that side, that it would be easy to see. But it could have also been lying on this bank where we are now, because initially when we first arrived, we kind of came up the drainage line and we weren't actually on this bank where we are now. So, you know, this bank probably in all likelihood might have been where he was sitting and he's kind of dashed off into these thickets and so I'm trying to look around and just trying to scan to try and see just a set of ears or a little tail flick or something like that that might give it away. It's the best way to spot a shy leopard is just to see like those ears moving. It's, at the end of the day though if it doesn't want us to see it it won't we won't be able to get any view of it it will just hide away but under the cover of darkness this animal should theoretically be a lot more kind of relaxed to come in towards the car because it wants to feed. I don't know if it has fed during the day. I'm, I'm not sure. I was obviously wasn't here this morning and so don't know how much of this carcass was left. But either way, very, very exciting when you've got kind of leopards around that behave slightly differently towards our normal ones. Right now, I was going to head towards the lions, but Taylor did so much work this morning to try and find them and that it's just only deserving that she heads there. And so we will send you across to Taylor as she gets a little bit closer and sees if she can find them. We are. We've just, however, stopped to have a look at a yellow-billed hornbill that is gobbling up what I can only imagine is termites, as there aren't very many insects around at the moment other than ants and termites. So I think it has found itself a harvester termite nest over there. It's amazing how they just gobble up so many. And before, they of course all run down to the safety of their mound. And I suppose that's an advantage that the harvester termites have, is that they don't build their mounds above the ground. They build them below the surface of, uh, of the earth. So as soon as they go down that tunnel, they're pretty much safe from birds like hornbills. Whereas the large fungus growing termites, they often have big chimneys. And what these birds will do is, because they have got fairly strong beaks, is that if the termites are busy working, and building their sort of uh, a new part of their mound, the mud is still quite soft and they'll break it open and then they're not safe. <laughs> but they're lucky. Wonderful. But let's carry on. <laughs> Paula, no, that's not Winston Churchbill, unfortunately. He lives at Chitwa Dam. Actually, Tristan needs to go and see him. That's what needs to happen. As Tristan needs to go and see Winston, he's so cool. Ah, leopard tracks, but I don't know when they're from. If they're from this morning, they must be from this morning. Unless Hosanna has made a, he's done a big walk. He could have come here. I don't really see any more tracks. So the kind of mm, says to me that I think, uh, I think they're from this morning. Why would they have been all the way over here? I don't know whose footprints those are. Sorry, I'm just quickly listening to the the radio. I'm going to be jumping on the radio every now and then. So, what we're going to go and do is we we're going to go to the lions just now. We're just doing a scenic way around. There's somebody else that wants to jump in front of us, desperate. So we'll let them go, have a look, and then we'll sit with them for a bit later. The more people that kind of push through now while they're sleeping and not doing much, that's the plan. They can have that sighting. We're waiting for golden light. We're waiting for the crepuscular period when they've got the upper hand and can hunt a buffalo because I said, uh, I'm not leaving until I see a buffalo hunt. Oh, I am, I am, but it, uh, that's my goal. And the next, next little while is to uh, try and achieve that. And at the moment, the chances are high because we have lions, we have buffalo, and we've got Craig to film it, so we're good to go. Are you ready, Craig? I actually saw Craig is doing his arm exercises for quick panning and things like that. 
We're practicing leveling really quickly and on the go, which is awesome. Wonderful. We might bump into. Hi, Alex. Not, not we might bump into hi, Alex. That's just Alex. Uh, <laughs> Tristan, I was just listening to him on the radio. No, we won't. He's just giving an update. He said something about Gallego Pan, and I want to find elephants that were around here because I haven't seen elephants for ages and I love them so much. But it's windy, so I don't know if they're going to be nice elephants today. I won't blame them if they're not going to be particularly friendly. That's fine. Everybody's entitled to have those days when you're not on the game. Okay. Boop, boop. I don't know why I've also started making weird noises again. Okay. Right, Emma's had enough of my stray sounds that I'm making this afternoon. Robot noises for some reason. At least it's not ha karate sounds. Uh, so Steve is still searching for all sorts of wonderful creatures. Perhaps he too will make some noises. And in those lions, we've just happened to bump into a hippopotamus out of the water in the middle of the day. He's busy moving along and feeding. Not something you would enjoy bumping into on foot, I can tell you that for sure. They just walk along and chomp, mowing the grass very, very short. They produce very nice grazing lawns with, those, with that mouth. And their teeth are not used at all in the gripping of the grass, it's just the lips. Can you imagine that? Just eating with your lips. I can't. Looks like a male to me. That's the Mara River in the background behind those trees, so not too far away. The clouds have come in. It's a nice cool afternoon. So I think that this individual thinks it's time. It's time to um, have a bit of a feed. Awesome Andrew. What a marvelous name that is. You want to know how they heal their sunburn? Well, quite often you can see, and let's look a bit closer on the skin. You see all the wounds on the hippo's back there. They've got, they've got a a chemical they produce. I'm trying to think of the name. It's just slipped my mind. That pinkish red liquid that comes off of the skin. It often looks like they're bleeding. It's actually where the hippo gets its name from. It's got hippo in the name. I wonder if anyone can remember and pop us a little tweet or a YouTube comment there and remind me. I should remember. I haven't used it in so long. But um, it's a little red liquid that comes out and actually works as a sun cream as well as a natural antiseptic to all of the wounds that you see on the back. That's a pretty average looking hippo back. We've seen much worse down at Chitwa. So they walk out in the wilderness and they get caught on thorns. Lions decide to try and eat them, get cuts and scratches. Male hippos fight with other male hippos. Younger male hippos get dominated by bigger ones and well invariably their skin is an absolute mess. So the hippo, what is it called? I can't remember. It has slipped my mind. A reddish fluid that is secreted from the glands of the skin on the hippo's back. And it is where it gets its name from. You can see he's got a mouth full of grass. Beautiful to see. There's just always something going on out here. There we go. Look at the short legs. Very difficult to work out the length of a hippo body by its track because when you see it walking you see it doesn't register at all there's no ways its back foot can step where its front foot did possibly on the th second or third stride so it's not easy to work out from a track how long or how big a hippo is but normally oh look at the flicking of the ear normally you can just tell by the feet and work on the size of the feet to determine how big an animal is and he's just munching away and you can see that's the red grass or the red oat grass there in the front of the picture and it's just kind of going in the mouth and you're just kind of chopping it off with the lips and it got very sort of medium size hippo sidoric acid sounds about right but it doesn't 100 percent sound right hippo it's hippo uh, i don't think it's an acid maybe maybe you are correct i think it's been so long since i've used the word there emma whoever commented there I have no doubt someone will know the, the correct answer and can correct us on that. Uh, hippo is enjoying the red grass, very high nutrients in their grass. Oh, Google. Google did that. Well, we had one of the guards drive past and he informed me as I had my branch perched beautifully on the dashboard. He said that this is Rus natalensis. 
I wonder if anyone out there, I was trying to check it on my phone just before, but our Wi-Fi doesn't seem to be working. But uh, Urs Natalensis, it could very well be, and he said that it's actually a good luck charm. So how's that? I had it perched on the front of the bonnet. Who knows what we're going to be able to see, but all I do know is that everybody likes to see me eat these things. So let's do the taste test, shall we? Are you ready? It's not great. It's not great. I've had better. I've also had worse. It's nowhere near the Magic Worry. Nowhere near the Terminalis Cirrusia. But due to the fact that there's no thorns on a plant like this, you can kind of assume that it's not going to taste very good. Because if it did, well, it would just get, just get eaten. Like chocolate cake without a container around it. Just get eaten. So you know there's going to be tannin in there. Indeed, there is tannin. So Emma suggests I leave it on the dashboard. I shall do. And maybe by doing that, we'll be able to find you something special. Last time I was here, I was able to see two leopards. I think my mission here is to be able to see three. Not today. I didn't get the name there, um, Emma, but um, you want to know how hippos bite with their lips. Well, the lips do close, and they kind of just... Kind of like if I used my hand on the gra on the, the leaf here. Turtle, you want to know how they... Well, if I kind of used my hand like this, they kind of just... And then they rip it. It's not the most it's not the most effective means of eating, I'll tell you that. But they've got a big mouth and they just kind of go through and just sort of mow it down. They aren't able to go very short, but they just kind of crop it down to sort of like a lawn, like you would mow your lawn back home. Any shorter than that, the grass doesn't do well. Hippos have no chance of overutilizing the grass because they can't eat down low. So just kind of rip it off with their mouth. It's not the most effective form of feeding. I'll tell you that much. And I'm still trying to think, it's on the tip of my tongue, this hippo, hippo, someone will remember, if not one of the viewers, I'm pretty sure Tristan or Taylor will remember. I can't believe I forgot. My head normally remembers a lot of things, but for some reason today, it's just slipped. Maybe the last leaf I ate has made me sort of forget what's going on. Yeah, everybody seems to be saying hippo sidoric acid sounds quite familiar. Just trying to... I pulled over so this car could move past and now he's stopped in the road so that they can take a picture of us. Seems to be the way today. Everybody wants to think of movie stars or something out here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think they would love to come for a viewer visit. At least a few people today have asked, do you mind if we take a photo? A lot of them just snap away. I'm quite camera shy, you know. James, you're quite camera shy as well, aren't you? Yes. yes, James is terribly camera shy. I'm extremely camera shy. Well, there's a whole lot of cars up here. And in Amara, that normally means only one or two things. I am very camera shy, Emma. Okay, well, this is the area where I was last time when I saw what we at the time called the Mo the Marsh Pride, but I think it's the Magoro Pride. I don't know. They might be right here. But in the meantime, let's go back down to Tristan, who's going to give you an update on the spotted cats. Well, unfortunately, we just left that carcass. Now, that leopard, we listened and listened and strained our ears for more alarm calls, and it's nothing. So that leopard is sat somewhere and is watching, and I think it's too shy to move back towards that carcass. So what I'm going to do is leave. We're going to go and try and see if we can find Hosanna in the meantime and we'll come back here at about I would say six o'clock when it just as that sun is starting to dip and it's starting to get cooler and, and, and darker and hopefully then we'll be able to get it right but it might be a long wait just sitting there for half an hour or so waiting just to see if he might come but it'll be worth it if, if he does arrive in, in that cover of darkness so that's the kind of plan go look for our little superstar the, the little chief in the meantime and then once We've done that and hopefully find him or maybe we won't have any luck then we'll come back here a little bit later but I'm so intrigued to know which leopard this is because whoever it is is not a fan of cars at all and so I'm pretty sure that that poor leopard is very 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 shy of what's going on. 
Right, now while I head off in the direction of Hosanna down to the south, I'm going to send you across to Taylor McCurdy, who is a fan, of, well, she's with Lions that are fans of cars actually. Lions who are fans of cars. Do they wave signs around and go, yay, cars? I don't know. Anyways, we're with Inkoomba Pride, everybody. Thank you, Aubrey. A little shout out there for finding them because they gave me many gray hairs this morning as I chased around. But it doesn't matter because we got them and they're still on the property. So that's what counts. Now, they're not sleeping. They're up and moving around. It's one of the Inkoomba lionesses. And they are tailing buffalo at the moment which is very very cool and then those two that you can see just lying in the shade those are the mangen sub-adult males they're both there so they're still with the pride but that lioness we were just looking at now did sort of growl and charge him but they they're playing it very cool which is awesome i think that's a great tactic to have by not responding at all they're not responding aggressively or even submissively. They kind of just sit and, and stay completely neutral. So they're not giving them a reaction, but they're also not giving them any more reason to react. And then the others are all slowly moving forward. So I think they're, they're behind the buffalo herd at the moment. And it is quite a big herd of buffalo. So I think they're hoping that maybe there'll be an old dugger boy, so an old buffalo bull that's just hanging back by himself or maybe cow and calf but they're definitely going to not attack the front of the herd that would be certain death would be so dangerous for them to do because we know that buffalo and we always talk about how social they are and the, how incredible their bonds are with one another they will chase these lions away and then chick chick yes the young male from the talamati pride is indeed uh was it the talamati yes i can't remember no was it? I'm trying, I've gone completely blank. Well, it was the Talamati young male, wasn't it? I can't remember what now, what's even going on. I don't even know what my name is anymore. I think it was him, the young sub-adult. I think that's correct. Someone please correct me because I've just gone completely blank. Yes, perhaps I have eaten some interesting leaves like Steve. No, I just um, have completely forgotten exa exactly who, who he is. Why did I think he was something else? Oh well, not a mat no, 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 I'm making things up. I don't know, someone please correct me. I've lost my mind apparently today and I don't even know my own name. That's wonderful. I know Snow the Inkahumas. <laughs> but yes, that other male is still here. So now there's a total of four males. It's amazing how the Inkahuma pride went from just one young sub-adult male left in the pride and all of a sudden they've got three more. <laughs> I don't know if, how the females feel about that. That just means that they need to catch bigger things. It, it could be interesting though um, as to what would happen uh, if they do catch a big buffalo. How oh, they'll all feed the fights and things amongst Rosalind, the lionesses don't do all the hunting. Sorry, I was generalizing there. The boys do quite a bit of hunting as well. It's just that they're young and inexperienced and are still with the pride. So the lionesses obviously aren't as big as the males. Um, they tend to hunt very, very well in conditions like this, but so do the males. See, it's not out in the open. Everybody can hide behind what little grass is left behind all the fallen trees. So having a big mane um doesn't stop these male lions from hunting but they can can of course be easily exposed if they're hunting out in a short grassland area then it'll be difficult but here everybody blends in so the males are very important especially for bringing down large prey like buffalo the, the aim of the game is to get the animal on its side as quick as possible because once it's down on the ground and it's pinned to the floor by a pile of lions uh, there's very little chance it can get up and it also then can't hurt the lions while the buffalo is standing up, he's got his horns, he's just got his, his size and, you know, can completely um, well, stampede them too and that would hurt quite a bit. So by getting the prey down on the floor, that's exactly what they want to do. The male lions are able to help that and pull the animal off of the feet. There they all go. All looking lovely, but hungry. That's fantastic for us. Oh my goodness, it seems as though 
it's just Tristan that now needs to get on to the cat train for this Monday afternoon because Steve in the Mara Triangle has also found a pride of lions of his own. <clears throat> yes, well, we didn't do the finding. We just followed the group of vehicles that were parked here and uh, until we got here, all we could see was a very white belly in the grass. And now we've got a couple cubs that are coming in from the side. I can see at least four individuals, there might be more. And this is exactly the area, you see the trees in the background, where I had, I'm thinking it's the same pride, I honestly couldn't tell you, but they had youngsters, they were quite little, uh, and they were right in the tree line at the back there, and it's when I saw one lioness and hyenas formed some ranks of about eight or nine, and they came charging in, and I was like, yes, I'm finally going to see the showdown of hyena versus lion. And one, as the hyena got close to the first lioness, a second lioness came out of the grass or the bushes and the hyenas all turned tail and fled. Absolutely disappeared. Well, here you can see we're a little bit far off. We no off-road driving in this area. We are here in the marsh. A number of vehicles around us. We go back to them. James, I'm sure they're much more entertaining than, than myself. And there's a youngster just off to the right over here is going to come and join. So there's a lioness with two youngsters doing a little bit of grooming. Oh, now that one's gone just behind the bush. You can see it just to the right. There it is. It's having a look at the vehicles. They are quite inquisitive when they are that sort of age. And we're in a perfect position. Everyone's trying to get right up in there. But, um, well, we'll just stay a little bit further away. We do have the camera for it, which most people don't quite have the view or the zoom that we have. Mm, there we go. It's getting time to get up, is it, youngster? Well, by the fact that this one's yawning, and the other adult was yawning, and now there's a bit of grooming going on. It looks like a looks like a young male, doesn't it? Hard to tell. They've got a little bit of fur around the neck, but it's a bit young. Oh, here we go. Just look between the tails, and you can tell. It's a little bit young, I would think, for it to start showing some man. Maybe he's an early bloomer. That happens. I remember being at, at what we call, uh, not high school, what do we, I can't even remember what school I went to, uh, middle school or little school when I was <laughs> 12 or 13, we're going to quickly go to South Africa and Tristan. Well, we've come across Hosanna and he's just killed a big female Nyala. So we're just trying to get in to show you what's going on. But there's also hyenas on the way in as well. So they are going to be with us fairly shortly and I think they're going to steal it away. But that is a fresh, fresh, fresh kill that he's just managed to take down. He's just only eaten the back end. You can see, look how heavily he's panting. He's managed to just pull that down and it's a really big Nyala that he's managed to get. But the hyenas, as we were arriving, I saw hyenas coming this way and so I think he's going to lose his kill in the next few minutes. And this is going to be a bit of a shame because he's done so well to grab a Nyala of that size. That really is quite something to see well, I mean, he's really graduated, hasn't he? He's gone from killing small things to rather large things. Well done, boy. That is very good. Now, you're going to need to take that up a tree very quickly because you're going to get found out. Here comes the hyenas now. So the hyenas are coming now. They're going to see him. I don't know if he's seen the hyena yet. But the hyena's on my back right. It's going to eventually start coming past. Now, he's going to see the hyena coming in in the next two minutes. Now, poor Hosanna, I think, is unfortunately going to end up losing this kill to this hyena. He's not going to keep it if he doesn't put his head up shortly. Hyena, there he's now seen that. He's seen the hyena now. Let's see if he tries. He's either going to be brave and try and chase the hyena, or he's going to try and pick this up. But this Nyala weighs so much already. It hasn't been taken. The stomach hasn't been taken out. It hasn't really been eaten, and so it's going to be quite tricky so we're going to open this up to a wider audience so i'm going to keep quiet quickly well it is a warm welcome to south africa as you can see we've got a leopard that's just killed and yarn and look it's trying to take it up the tree 
It's going to be very difficult. This is a very heavy carcass for a young leopard. And there comes Aina. Aina's coming in. It's going to try and steal it from this poor leopard. Yep, unfortunately, it's just too heavy for that leopard to have taken up. He's a young male leopard, and that's a massive carcass that he's trying to take up. And unfortunately for him, it really was going to be too heavy. He tried his absolute best to get it up there, but that's ridiculous. Now, this is insane now you'll see the hyena is going to go absolutely crazy it's going to tear into this carcass and try and eat as much as it can as quick as it can to try and get as full now what will happen i think with this carcass because it's quite big is that leopard is going to be quite clever about it the hyena will eat itself stupid it's going to eat to the point where it can't actually fit in another thing and as long as other hyenas don't arrive here then there's a potential for this leopard to be able to steal back his carcass but it's such a shame because he must have killed this within the last half an hour and unfortunately for him him he's now lost it to the hyena for now but hopefully he'll be able to get it back again he's quite good at that he often catches quite big meals and they get taken by hyenas and he'll then come in and kind of take back whatever's left over but this is absolutely epic in the madness i forgot to introduce myself so my name is tristan and this on camera i've got david this afternoon it really is the most spectacular way to spend an afternoon we've been so so fortunate we've just come into this area and we managed to find these guys and it's all just happened as soon as we are arrive basically we just found him kind of standing over the nyala and then these hyena arrived really quite epic poor hosana he's unfortunately lost his meal for now so joe yes bad hyena unfortunately but that is the way of the wild and for you know hyenas also have to eat and the hyena has obviously heard the scream of this nyala when it died and was throttled and that's why it's come in to investigate unfortunately now for those of you who have joined us who don't know who this is well we've got hosana on the left which is a young male leopard of about two years and eight months old he is the, the youngest of the the sort of male leopards that we see in this area and he's known as the little chief that's what his name means and he really is probably one of the most famous favorite leopards we have here. He's incredibly relaxed and he spends a vast majority of his time on Juma and he really kind of entertains us with all kinds of incredible sightings. But I'm sad for him that he just couldn't get it up but I didn't think he would be able to. Unfortunately for him it's really just too heavy a carcass for him to be able to have hoisted it um, before that hyena got in. If he had ho tried it before the hyenas arrived, he might have got it right. But you can see he jumped and the weight of that carcass just pulled him down a little bit. That carcass probably weighs nearly what he does. So to take his own body weight as well as this carcass's weight up is really quite tricky. And now you see what he's doing. He's just sitting there waiting, biding his time. He's going to hope that this hyena finishes up and gets full and his stomach swollen and then he'll be able to kind of go in there and try and grab whatever remains left. So Evan, the reason he's not attacking the hyena is that he knows that a fight with the hyena is in all likelihood going to injure him quite badly. And you know, a bite from a hyena on the leg means that this poor leopard would be badly injured and probably wouldn't actually be able to move and hunt and find food for itself. So much easier to go and find another prey item than it is to be able to kind of you know fight with hyena and then limp around and, and possibly then die so it's they're very wary of hyena's strength and they know that they can rather get a food at another time but you can see that hyena is going right into the cavity of that nyala and what it's trying to get is all of the stomach content so it's trying to get bits of stomach bits of liver those kind of things that are full of nutrients and once it's eaten all of that then it will start tucking into the meat around the rump area what's going to be interesting with this is that that hyena is never going to finish this nyala it's going to be far too much food for this hyena and so what will happen is it will eat and eat and eat and eat its stomach is going to get to the point where it cannot take in anymore and that might be the opportunity for our young leopard to run in and grab it once again and then try get it up into the tree once it weighs less the problem is is that with this hyena here I wouldn't be surprised that more hyenas arrive. The clan that we've got in this area is quite big at the moment. Well, not it's not the most massive clan, but there's lots of them around because there's a den not too far from here. And that means that they all might start coming in with the commotion. Luckily, so far, there hasn't been any noise. So the hyena didn't cackle or make any kind of noise, and neither did the leopard. And so it's still quite quiet at this stage. Now, you might hear some vehicles in the background. And that's others that are just joining us to come and see what's going on and to see this unbelievable sighting that we're having this is really quite spectacular the visual obviously is quite tricky because we're in a dense area right on the edge of a very steep embankment that leads down into a riverbed the perfect place for a leopard to go about its business and i actually think what this leopard probably did 
as he probably lay in one of these little furrows and waited for this nyala to come along and then grab it. Now, Lisa, will the hyena eat the face? The hyena will eat everything it can. So it will start in the innards and get all those really nutritious organs, and then it's going to go through onto the sort of rump end, and then it will eat even the, the legs, the face. It just won't consume some of the big spinal bones that these bushbuck have, although they've got very powerful jaws. Now, if some of you are a bit squeamish, I do apologize, and it's probably a good time to look away, because when that hyena's feeding, he's going to be pulling out all kinds of bits out of this poor nyala, and obviously the nyala can't feel anything anymore, but, you know, it's clearly kind of going to get fed on quite quickly but it's amazing the haste at which a hyena eats it's pretty incredible so nina it depends on the age of the leopard it depends on how big um, and powerful that leopard is so a really big male so somebody like um, Hosanna's dad Tingana who's a big sort of 85 90 kilogram leopard well he would easily probably be able to have taken that up before the hyena got there but because Hosanna is still growing he hasn't quite reached maturity yet and that means that he unfortunately isn't quite as powerful enough I've seen his dad actually take carcasses that probably weigh double what that Nyala weighs up into a tree when he was a bit younger when he was around sort of his prime seven eight years but since he's gotten a little bit older, he also struggles a bit. But this was a fair size for a leopard. I mean, this is a, is a big animal, and Yala is not a small carcass in any stretch of the imagination. But what an amazing sighting. That was so cool. It all happened so quickly. And you can see the hyena is now kind of covered in blood. They stick their heads right into the carcass. What's interesting is they actually feed very differently to what we see from a leopard. A leopard would have fed um, a lot slower, obviously, and would have eaten from the tail through that soft tummy section and then upwards and then it would have gone over the back end and then eventually the head and legs whereas hyenas will just go in wherever they can and start feeding and if more hyenas arrive it becomes a feeding frenzy of note and everybody just grabs pieces and pulls the problem is is as this hyena is doing this and is starting to go towards the ribs it's going to start cracking bones and that cracking of bones is going to attract more hyenas for sure and that poor leopard then might not get what he wants so i'm hoping that this hyena just eats its fill decides to go for water and then leaves and this high leopard can get his carcass back but oh, it's tough being a leopard out here it's not easy when you've got multiple other animals that want to steal from you insane Poor Hassan, you can see he's breathing very heavily at the moment. It's a hot afternoon and a lot of energy has been expended trying to catch that Nyala. It means he's now trying to catch his breath. But what an incredible sighting we've just had that has really been absolutely amazing. We've been super spoiled to be able to have seen what we've just seen. We really, really have. Well, that's all we've got time for, and so we will bring this live again if anything major starts to happen. But I hope that you enjoyed this, and we hope to see you soon on Safari Live. You can just Google Safari Live if you would like to continue watching, because we will stay out with this leopard for the majority of this afternoon. And so if you do want to carry on watching, you can jump on to that platform. But it's been an absolute pleasure. So from David and myself, we'll see you all next time. Whew, well, that was quite something. Poor Hosanna, unfortunately, has lost his meal for now, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he's going to get it back. I have a feeling he will, so we'll just sit here and see how this all goes. And while we do that, let's send you back to Steve in the Mara, who I think is sitting still with the lions. I'm not quite sure, but either way, I'm sure those lions are having a really good rest. Well, Tristan, terribly sorry for the little chief that that is what's happened to him and his dinner but that is what happens folks and you were able to see it obviously you didn't see the takedown but how quickly did the hyena come in but we are with what we believe to be the marsh pride um, I haven't really seen them too up close and personal this is the first time and James is liking to have a look and take a video of the lioness having a poo thank you to that youngster for standing in the way so you can't actually see what's going on behind but what beautiful golden light and the lions are slowly up and moving a very different story being up here in the Mara with this the open vistas and uh, lots of vehicles obviously come to these sightings and James assures me there should only be five and that's easy for us because we can park quite far off and we can view with these cameras
as the lions slowly start eyeing out what seems to be herds of wildebeest and zebra in the distance. I've counted three adult lioness so far and then a couple of youngsters that might be ahead there. There's one about to come into frame. The youngsters all look about the same sort of age, about eight months, somewhere around there. One by one they move forward before lying down in the grass waiting for the next advance. The temperature drops pretty quickly up here. I wonder if that individual has spotted anything. So James has got his jacket on. Might be time for me to be doing so soon as well. The sun is setting in the background but um, do you think these lines are going to get up to James? They're probably going to move off but we're not in an area where we can follow them off-road so um, we're just going to view them from a distance and thankfully we've got the beautiful camera so if they do move off I'm sure all these vehicles will move out of the way because they can't see them from far but we can let's go back shall we amazing how the camouflage they are So as these lions start to lie down, maybe they'll get up soon. Let's go back to Tristan, who I believe ha hyenas are moving the meat. Well, the hyena's not on the move at the moment. The hyena's still just scoffing its face as it would want to. It's really trying to get as much food out of this as possible. And what might happen, though, is when it realizes it can't eat anymore, it might actually start to try and drag this carcass away. And that might be Hosanna's gap to try and actually get it. But poor Hosanna, I feel so sorry for him because it's a really seriously good meal that he's gotten himself and he's managed to lose it. And at this time of the day, who would have thought that a hyena would have been patrolling this area and moving around? It must have just heard it from nearby. The, the carcass that Mpukazi and Hosanna and Tingana were at is not too far from here and that's probably what happened but look at his chin you can see even the blood on his chin from where he was trying in all likelihood to kill it you can actually even see on the Nyala if you so I do warn you it is a bit gruesome it's busy pulling off its ears at the moment but the Nyala you can actually see the blood coming from its neck from where he tried to actually kind of you know strangle it and, and, and get that choke hold on Oh, sorry, Emma, if you can just repeat the name, I just broke up your car, I was driving next to us. Kopel. How long will this meal last, Aina? Well, it depends on how much the Aina ends up getting, but uh, a fair amount of time, I can tell you. They, you know, listen to that, though. It was actually, you could hear it crunching on the bone, but it stopped now. But this should last it. Oh, there we go. Like I say, if you are squeamish. But, so this would probably last this hyena. I mean, if, it depends on how much it eats, but it, it theoretically would last it until tomorrow morning. I mean, this would be a serious meal. The hyena is going to be swollen, swollen, swollen by the end of this. It's going to be full 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 and it still won't finish this carcass so it's it's not enough I and mean, there's more than enough there for both Hosanna and the hyena to get a good feed as long as the hyena doesn't actually end up kind of eating all of it and kind of taking you know the carcass away and dragging it potentially back towards others or if others arrive if others arrive Hosanna's got very little chance of getting this back at this stage and the more this hyena crunches away as it's doing now the harder this is going to be for poor Hosanna to actually get a meal again so I do feel f sorry for him in many respects he, unfortunately it's it's a tricky one because he's dragged it quite far I can actually see the drag mark it's kind of come from close to the road area and he's kind of dragged it towards here and so he's probably very very tired already after wrestling with that animal as well as then dragging it you know the strength would have been out and so he needed a time just to catch his breath before he could try and hoist it and he tried valiantly to do it but it just ultimately was too heavy for him but this hyena theoretically would be able to feed again tomorrow if it really wanted to it would just top up it wouldn't be able to eat as much as today Peter, it's possible. I have seen leopard and hyena feed off a carcass at the same time, but very, very, very seldom does it happen. Um, you know, leopards are sometimes very nervous, and, and so are hyenas. It's normally when you get quite a large male leopard and, and a young hyena that's too scared to challenge, and a male leopard that just doesn't, maybe is not quite as fully grown and doesn't quite want to challenge 
the hyena and, and then the two of them sometimes do settle to feed but it's never sort of amicable and it's not ideal for either one so you'll find that they'll try their very very best to get it away from one another and if Hosanna can get it once it's lightened and get it, he'll try and get it up into a tree as quick as possible then he might be okay you, you never know it's it's one of those things where we know that this week he's lost a bushbuck kill to um, hyenas and he managed to get that back and so I'm hoping it's going to be more of the same today. It's just unfortunate that, unfortunately, the... Oh, you can see he's kind of drag it away now. And poor hyena is going to try and get, take this away. I'm sorry, Hosanna, but I don't think you're going to get much left of your kill. There it goes. It's been kind of pushed and pulled and taken away from him. And the more that this is happening, like I say, this is more it's going to attract others. Anyway, we'll see what happens. There's still a lot to play out here. So while we do that, let's send you back across to Taylor and see if those lions have considered those buffalo as yet. And they're just sleeping as they normally do. So I think we were lucky when we first got here. Had them moving around just a little bit. But now they've gone quite flat in the grass. So you haven't really missed too much. But very exciting things. Um, with Hosanna, of course, Tristan managed to find him. He's the Leopard King. You know, he's got a I think he's actually got a magnet. And he, he drags him out. Or he's carrying catnip in his pockets. I'm not sure. But we'll have to search him when he gets back for a game drive to try and figure it out for once and all. Um, now, <laughs> I don't know when his lines are going to get up and start moving. But just some interesting things that I've noticed when they did move. The Telemati male that's recently joined the Pride. They don't even growl at him anymore. He sleeps right in the middle of the Pride, which is really cool. So they've actually accepted him fairly quickly. And, yeah, he's somewhere in there. No one even twitches when he arrives anymore. I mean, I don't, I don't think they pay him as much attention as, uh, you know, the rest of the pride pays to one another. Not into the young Mangani boys, though. Not yet. I feel kind of sorry for those young boys. They've had an exceptionally tough life. And now all they want is, I suppose, companionship. They've been on their own for quite some time now. They can indeed, Eddie, infect the pride with mange, but the thing is, is that the pride are not having any physical contact with those two boys, so they're fine. The only way that the Nkuhumas will pick up mange is if they repetitively uh, have contact with them. So they're rubbing up and greeting one another, um, even, I think, sharing a carcass once or twice and, and rubbing up, uh, up against one another just a couple of times. That's really not going to spread... The, um, the mange, remember mange takes over animals that are not in particularly good conditions. So if they're malnourished, so they haven't been eating properly, which would explain why these boys have mange, is because remember they were left on their own at a very young age to try and fend for themselves, to try and hunt for themselves. Must have been so stressful, not, you know, being accepted into any prides, big pride males chasing them away whenever they see them. So now they've come across the Nkuhumas and are like, okay, this is quite nice. And the Nkuhumas seem to be quite tolerant of them. Yes, they growl every now and then and there's the odd charge, but they're not physically attacking them and pushing them away. They're kind of just saying, you stay over there. So I really don't think we need to worry about the Nkuhumas. They are fit. They are strong, healthy lions. Look at little floppy ear. Well, she's not so little anymore and she doesn't have a floppy ear anymore. But um, the last cub, or well, the litter from... Um, the last of the Nkuhuma cubs, she's the youngest, and uh, she had mange so severely that her ears swelled up and folded over. But look at her. She survived white muscle disease and she got rid of all that mange. So the fact that these cats are so fit and healthy, I think that if they get a little bit of mange on them, I, I don't even think we'll notice it. I really, really don't. Marcy, we're going to have to wait and see. I can't answer that question. I don't know if the Nkuhuma Pride will let the two young Mangani boys join on a kill. Um, they might. I suppose it depends on what mood there is. I think it depends on the size of the buffalo. They definitely wouldn't be allowed to eat first. They might have to wait and then they'll be tolerant of it. But again, I'm only speculating because I don't know what's going to happen. Um, they, they've obviously shown that they're not particularly impressed by them. But the fact that they can sleep like you know five or six feet away that speaks volumes it just shows you how accommodating the Inkahuma pride really is so they're there and 
pretty much exactly what the Talamati male went through. Uh, he constantly just kept up with the pride, kept hanging around, trying to make more and more contact, and eventually uh, they became, you know, tolerant of him. They're like, cool, well, you can join us now. You have passed whatever challenge they have issued. Bless you, lion. Bless you. Uh, so, um, so, yeah. So, uh, it'll be interesting to see. I don't really know. I hope that they do catch something, though, and I hope that those boys do get an opportunity to feed. They all look like they need a good meal, but they're going to have to bring down a buffalo bull, perhaps even a buffalo bull and a young calf or something like that to feed all of these hungry, hungry cats. Because if they're all here, there should be 14 lions. 11 from the Nguhuma Pride, plus the Talamati sub-adult, and then, of course, the two Mangani young boys. Big rollover. That's a good sign. Let's hope we get some yawning and things like that to go along with it. Right, now all sorts of drama is unfolding just to the south of us with Hosanna, but the hyenas won this one and they're munching on a meal. They did indeed. Unfortunately, the hyenas did win this so far and they probably in all likelihood are going to continue to win it at this stage. Poor Hosanna is kind of just watching as his meal is being devoured away. There's still a lot there though. It looks like not that much, but I can promise you there's still quite a bit of meat. Both all four legs are still there. There's still a bit of the neck and so he'll be able to eat quite a bit. But it's amazing how much damage a hyena can do in such a short space of time. You know, that hyena arrived here and there was a whole nyala and wow, you look at it and you see how that whole stomach has been opened, ribs have been eaten and even the neck region is being guzzled down so it is seriously amazing how much food these guys can put away its belly is starting to stretch though you can see that there's that swell that's starting to happen and they'll continue to eat though hyena's got a, a belly that seems to just never stop swelling out it's quite incredible how much they do but here you can see it right big fat healthy tummy and we're going to have to get used to this and so is Hosanna now that there's a den on Juma the hyenas are going to be here far more regularly than what they were before and you can actually see that it's busy eating the kind of face area and trachea in that area so it's quite rough I'm afraid which is not ideal but anyway we'll hopefully he'll kind of have his full now and move off and go and have some water and Hosanna can get this back the problem is is Hosanna is going to have to take out that stomach that stomach's going to make it very awkward to hoist so if the hyena can grab all of that then that's fine and then Hosanna can get all the good meat on the sides but really is making short work of that one side of that nyala very very quickly indeed and as you can see what we were talking about and what Taylor was talking about this morning and I spoke about it a few days ago and how different the, the difference between carcasses being eaten by hyenas and wild dogs as opposed to a leopard and that carcass that we saw in the tree up at near Bufelzook Dam it looks very similar to this it's been stripped and kind of ribboned out by the hyenas they don't have a feeding sort of pattern they just eat from everywhere as you can see there i mean the neck's been taken a bit of the sort of stomach area the, the head area whereas a leopard would have started from that rump and would have slowly ate its way forward and would have been far more consistent about the way that it did an almost surgical like in comparison to the brute force power that the hyenas display it's incredible to see kind of how much power these guys actually have in the ability to break down bones, particularly big thick bones like jaws and skulls and even the sort of vertebra of the neck. Poor Hosanna though, I feel sorry for him. It's been a tough winter in many respects when it's come to food. He's really done well in finding a lot of food, but he's also had a serious struggle when it's come to keeping his food. So he's been good at catching and, and actually getting it, but Keeping it is a whole different story for our poor young male. He's unfortunately lost more than he's probably kept at this stage. Although, you know, can't moan too much. He's been scavenging off a kill for the last couple of days. So I suppose what goes around comes around for our young prince. And he'll learn valuable lessons for this. He'll, you know, um, he'll definitely try and kind of figure out better ways and i was as surprised as he is probably that hyenas are lurking at this time of the day and have run in and found him it's really you wouldn't have expected it at all right well hyenas still devouring the carcass we hope that it'll finish up soon and hosana can get this back we're going to be patient and wait in the meantime though let's send you back across to steve in the mara who's still sitting with his lions and i wonder if they're going to be any active this afternoon 
thank you so much. The action all happens at once. I think it's all got to do with the fact that I put this branch on the front of the dashboard that suddenly, not just myself, but my other two Wild Earth brothers and sisters were blessed as well. Well, we're thinking this is the Marsh Pride. I don't really know. I'm quite new to the lions up here, but one of these lioness is missing the tip of her tail. So I'm pretty sure that should be an easy characteristic for those who have viewed these animals before. I'm going to have to do some research. James seems to think the same as me. It's either the Marsh Pride or it might be the Olalolo Pride, do you think, James? Mm, that's what he thinks. But there are three lioness and I think five cubs. So it's a total of eight. And the cubs are all about the same age there when the ones were stalking forward. There's the first lioness coming forward now. Well, there's a second one on the grass there, but most of them are youngsters that have all moved to the front. They are quite hungry, it would seem. They get a little bit ahead of themselves. The over-boisterousness, oh, but you don't have to frame. Keep with that lioness. There is another lioness that has just crossed the road by the vehicle. So that makes four adults. She's going to be joining from the left in a second. There we go. Ravinda, it is very different up here. It is a vastness that is very hard to comprehend. There is no chance of even capturing it with the camera. Um, it's, you don't know where to look, really. Uh, just what I've seen this morning and yesterday with regards to the, the herds of wildebeest and zebra is just absolutely mind-boggling. Um, I think the, the, the busyness with regards to the vehicles that I've experienced this afternoon is something I'm going to have to get used to. I like the, the, the Juma sort of guidelines of, of, of sightings and, and only so many vehicles in a sighting. It just keeps things sort of under a certain certain threshold. I think we've had about 25 cars pass us to come in for these lions and slowly but surely they're all leaving. Well, as we speak, another lioness has sat up in the background. There are five lionesses here now and five cubs. So that is awesome to have a look on my phone. I took some photos of the prides yesterday because uh, Jamie and I'm uh, not sure who else, Scott most likely, have put up all sorts of ID features. There is not an adult actually, that's a youngster. You can see the spots are still there. That's an older than the other cubs that we've been looking at. There's some intention on the face of some of these adults as they're slowly starting to move. The first thing I saw long ago before we got into the sighting was, well, with the vehicles parked here, is I saw this topi in the distance, and James is going to try and show him to you now. Topi on the right-hand side here, standing on top of their characteristic sort of mounds. He's moved from one to another. There he is. He was a little bit further to the left. But he was standing high up on that mound and he's been checking these lines out while they were still sleeping. And Topi are very reliable out here for identifying where lions might be. You can see the Thompson's gazelle in the background and the zebra and the wildebeest have absolutely no idea. But the, the hartebeest, not the hartebeest, <laughs> the Topi is standing on top of the mound and is very vigilant to the goings on. And that indeed will stand it in good stead when it comes to the hunting that is no doubt going to take place very soon. But the overexcitedness of the hungry cubs is probably going to spoil any hunt that might come about. They are still here in the long grass in front of us. But um, when the cubs start going forward like that, it is because they are very hungry. The adults looked quite hungry to me. And it's probably going to take hours before they actually are successful because when the cubs are too keen, they don't have the necessary patience or stalking skills required to actually get close to an animal. And so I've seen it with lions when the cubs absolutely ruin the hunt. <laughs> they get a bit boisterous, they get a bit bored in the hunt, and they start jumping on each other, and next thing the animals get alerted, and they run off. And eventually, after a number of attempts, the youngsters realize that it's in their best interests to stay quite far back if they want to have dinner and let the adults get on with things. And you can see the intention. They're looking straight at that topi. There's some, well, there might not be, it's hard to tell, but there's a few zebra behind it. That is definitely the direction that they're heading onto. 
Well, from the lions of the Maasai Mara to Taylor McCurdy with the mane of a lion and a pride of her own. Here we are. Look, they're still doing nothing. Just fast asleep in the grass and fast. Uh, the Well, the, sorry, the crust crepuscular period is approaching us quite quickly that's what I was trying to say um, but now we're basically playing the patience game but I don't know how patient I'm going to be it sounds like the buffalo are heading north and crossing out of Juma so that's not really good for us because these lions should have been on top of them by now if we were going to see anything happen but we're trying our best we're hoping that something is going to happen. Otherwise, I'm going to probably move off and, and carry on with our afternoon. Yes, Phil. Well done. That's what we've been talking about for the last uh, couple of days now, is how exciting this all actually is with the new males coming in and lingering around this pride. Obviously, they are not trying to take over the pride and mate with the females. I don't think that they've got much interest in that. But I think what they're after is potentially uh, forming a coalition. And everybody was worried. Just remember how you were all very panicked about the Nguruma male being all on his own. He's, he hasn't got a good chance of survival because he'll be by himself. Now look at all the friends that he's got. You know, he hasn't really chosen them, but that doesn't matter. At least there's some lions that want to perhaps be a part of, uh, of his coalition. And I think that that's quite special. I mean, I don't think any of us could have predicted uh, that this was all going to happen. I had no idea. I was hoping that he'd join up with some other lions and it seems like uh, instead of him moving off and finding others, they found him. So sad that yes, two of the boys have got mange, but um, I really don't think it is anything to worry about. And I think once those t um, the young Mangani boys start to eat properly again and do a bit of grooming, I think grooming really hasn't been a priority on their list and we get a bit of rain, I think that they'll be fine. I think that they'll make a full recovery. We've obviously seen lions with mange and they've had it a whole lot worse, but these boys are older now. You know, they, 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 I think that they're fairly, they're fairly fit. So, so yeah, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I don't know. Anyways, so, uh, so yeah, I think it's great. Lachlan, I think if the Birminghams arrive there, there'd be a bit of commotion. I don't, firstly, I don't think that the Birminghams will come back up here. I, I, I highly doubt it. They're too preoccupied down uh, down south. But if they were to come here, they, I, I think they would even chase the Nkuhuma male away now. And they haven't been here for quite some time. He's looking big and strong now. So I think all four males would be chased right out of this pride very, very quickly. You know, I don't know if the, the, if the those um, those males will really recognise that one young Nkuhuma. Remember, they don't actually even care about their own male offspring. Um, they normally chase them out anywhere between two and a half and three years old. Sometimes it can even be a little bit younger than that. Maybe these boys will have an opportunity to stay a bit longer because there's no big males around at the moment. The evokers pop on every now and then. But they're here so regularly, uh, you know, we can't really call them uh, our males. I mean, Nguma Pride still runs away from them. They don't, they're not too fond of them at all. So I haven't really seen any more rolling around. It's just that one that's up with her leg up, all fast asleep. But we're going to keep, we'll sit here for a little bit longer and hope that we get to see more yawns and ear twitching and rolling around. Right. Let's go back a little bit further south to Tristan, who I don't think is going anywhere either. No, you know me too well by now that I will not be going anywhere. Unfortunately, I have this addiction and there's not really much I can do about it. I, it's not something I want to change anyway about sitting with leopards as much as I can. I absolutely thoroughly enjoy it and poor Hassan is still watching his carcass being torn apart, the hyena is still going at it, and it's slowed its feeding rate right down now. It's kind of eating away at the skull more than anything else, and so has crunched a few bones and has kind of licked things up. But the longer it stays here for, the more it worries me because the darkness will start coming, and that's when you're going to see a little bit more hyenas arriving, or a few more hyenas, should I say, in very bad English, but a few more hyenas should be arriving, and that will not be ideal at all for poor Hosanna. So 
you know, I'm hoping that this this male finishes up and, and then is done and moves off. Now, for those of you who know the, the Juma clan members, I've been scrolling through a whole bunch of ID kits that were kindly sent to me by Michael Fleetwood, who does a very good job at identifying hyenas, along with many of you that's, that know the hyenas super well. And so it looks like Causa, I think it's Causa, is that maybe somebody can confirm for me, but he's he's got a bit of a cut on the top of his head at the moment that kind of his little red mark that i've seen on his head for the last few days and then he's got this archway of spots on his right side that's normally the easiest way to sort of tell obviously now he's facing with his left side to us at the moment that makes it a little bit more tricky but on his right side there's a way to tell now there is another car that's going to be coming in so poor tax has had to sit and look at nothing but a bush for the last 10 minutes but i just wanted to move slightly forward and just so that we can get a better view of Hassan's face it's not going to be my match and tax will still be able to get in how's that david is that a bit better there we go so they, it still allows space for poor tax who's been waiting so patiently for like I say, about 20 minutes looking at just a quarry bush. It's a very tricky area. There's only really space for two cars to see. And so I just wanted to move a little bit so we can see Hassan's face, but still allow Tax enough space that he can actually see what's going on as well. But how incredible an afternoon. And we've had the Inkuma Pride with all their tag-alongs at the moment. It's amazing. They seem to be growing in numbers without having cubs, which is quite odd. And then lions up in the Mara as well, down here in... The Sabi Sands, you know, obviously we've got Osana providing entertainment and that other kill that we haven't quite figured out who it is just yet and we don't really know who exactly is there. Now look, Osana's sneaking in. I wonder if he's going to try and steal this back. He might do so. He's going to just have a little look and see. He was just thought maybe he got an opportunity or a whiff to be able to get in there and get to that carcass before this hyena kind of carried on, but no, sorry, Hosanna, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer, I'm afraid. Now, what I'm going to do is try and see if I can just maybe move back a little bit now. Now that Hosanna's out in the open for tax to be able to see a little bit better, I'm just going to move slightly back a little bit so that they can get in a little bit more. Right, now, while I kind of reposition and sort everything out and we get everybody in the right places, let's send you back across to Steve in the Mara. Now, hopefully his lions, who sound like they've been playful and have done quite a bit, carry on doing so in that they provide him with more entertainment during the course of the afternoon. We have got one of the youngsters in the front. He's busy stalking, but it's far off still. It looks quite close. But those zebra... And there's a few Thompsons, Gazelle, excuse me, and a Topi not far away, but they're not that close. And the Topi is busy looking at him. Who? I can't really tell from here. But it's the, the art and the practice that's important. Awesome to see the youngsters doing their thing. And the adults are right at the back, basically just watching. So, having a look at some ID features. Um, with a missing tail, it's very likely that this is the Magora Bride, which my records show should only have three adult lioness. So maybe there's a few within the Pride that are extra that haven't quite been identified. But it is, also hasn't been that easy. We haven't been that close to them to really get any ID features. The one who's missing the tip of her tail has also got a, a weird sort of dark patch on her whiskers on the left-hand side. So we're hoping to get another look at her. Well, the good news is that the one topi has moved off, but the other one is still watching. Now, very good sentinels. And the zebra are probably quite happy. Here we go. That second one snuck up. Oh, you're looking at another spot there, James. <laughs> it's hard to keep up. They look identical in the long grass. Now, I think those are three of the youngsters that are right in the front doing their thing they must be hungry to be putting in the effort to go forward there's the topi you can see him just on the right of the screen there it's not the same topi as before it is a second one So the topi will watch them until it feels it's safe. It'll probably run away 
when it realises the lions have honed in on it, but predators don't generally go after animals that are alert. Even though it is looking in that direction, those zebra to the left there are a much better looking target. And maybe it will change its attention now, but you can tell the angle of its direction is looking pretty much towards the topi. I'm sure it will learn as time goes by that um, animals that are looking at you are not the ones you go for. Criminals learn that. You don't go for the attentive people. You go for those that are playing on their phones and completely oblivious. You can't hear it, I'm sure, but there are the snorts and shouts of some hippopotamus in the far distance. Angelina, Topi's an alert call. I'm sure they do. I haven't actually heard it myself, um, but it, I have no doubt it would be some form of snorting. James, have you heard Topi's alarm calling? You haven't, eh? I mean, I think, I'm sure they would, but I haven't heard it. I'm sure someone out there's heard it. I don't have any um, any topi calls on my phone, but I'm definitely going to check it out, Angelina. But I've no doubt they've got some form of, of, of alarm call, which would be a snort. I don't think it's a weird whistle. Uh, they are very similar to the tetsubi, which have a snort. And they snort and run. But their body language is always indication. And quite often the, the herds of topi will follow each other's body language. The zebra don't seem to care at all that the topi are staring for the last hour and a half in this direction. You see they're completely unaware. Maybe they're waiting for that ever, ever, oh, what's the word, characteristic call that they probably know so well of the topi. They keep looking up going, okay, well the topi hasn't shouted yet, everything must still be cool. Okay, we can still feed for a little bit, chaps. There we go, a couple of the zebra are starting to look in that direction, but not too concerned. And the thing with open spaces like this is animals like zebra, topi, buffalo, you know, you can generally get away from the lions. Well, buffalo, they can't run that fast, but all the other animals will definitely get away from lions. The lions have to get incredibly close if they want to, in fact, grab them and bring them down. But if we come back to the rest of the group in front of us here, James, they're slowly starting to, to get themselves organized. starting to kind of move. There's a bit of yawning happening, a bit of flicking of the tails, and that seems to be an adult lioness on the left, an adult on the right, that are going to slowly start moving out into the flanks. And we will follow this as it goes. We go back to Taylor McCurdy. Her lions seem to be getting up. Not quite. They're literally just rolling around as we speak. I think it will be a little while before they eventually uh, wake up properly. <sighs> Sorry, I'll get away, fly. There's no need to sit on my face. Sorry. And then when I tried to blow it off, it didn't even want to respond to that. So I had to hit myself in the face. It was a lot of fun. Anyways, um, that's one of the young boys, I think, that's staring up like that. You can see he's got quite a hairy chest. That looks like the uh, Telemati male, actually. Everyone else is uh, fast asleep. Let's see. I did see some Anyala moving around behind us. So maybe that's what he's sort of seen, but they're a fair distance away still. And the rest of the pride haven't even noticed just yet. But I think they're hungry. Look at them. The rest of them are like, oh, I'm so tired. Oh, we don't want to get up yet. I feel like that's what they're all saying in their own silent lion language. Apparently I just made Emma yawn in final control. Good. I'm going to watch. I'm going to do your yawn now too. <sighs> How many of you yawned after that? Hashtag Safari Live. Let us know. Or tell us on the YouTube chat too. If uh, I yawned. And do any of you ever yawn when a lion yawns? I feel like he's going to do one soon. Should we do a poll? Yes. Let's do a poll. Right, everybody, we're going to do a poll. Are you ready? The poll will be on Twitter, however, so if you 
uh, don't have Twitter, so now is the time to download it and uh, get your account sorted out so you can participate in today's poll. Today's poll will be, do you yawn after any of the big cats yawn? Does it encourage you? Well, you obviously know that whole theory behind it. Let's see what you all say. You can vote yay or nay. It'll probably say yes or no on the poll, but just in case, isn't you know, in case there wasn't the yay or nay option. Well, I can hear it sounds like either a... Oh, yeah. <laughs> the options are yes, no, or yawn, apparently. That's hysterical, right? That's funny. Yeah, so yes or no, and then if you yawned right now, click yawn. That'd be great. Let's see what he does. He's, he's intrigued. But again, he's so... He's quite... Well, they're a distance away. What are you going to do? You just jump over the other lions? <laughs> Fat chance he's got of doing that, of successfully catching... Catching them. There's a, one other one that's head up now. But you know what? I can hear... All birds alarming now. Franklins... Cysticulars, chagras. So for any antelope walking around here, they're gonna be suspicious now. I feel like their cover's been blown. I don't think you can hear the birds, it might be a bit soft. Goodness gracious, it seems like all the hyenas on Juma have all um, arrived at the party uh, with Tristan and Hosanna. Well, not all of them. It's just another one that's arrived and it's causing a little bit of friction between them and they're having a little go at each other. And so, unfortunately, though, that's the end of it because they would have made enough noise now to actually get these other hyenas to come in. And as soon as the likes of pretty and corky arrive here the big females there's no chance this whole kind of carcass will be destroyed in seconds so unfortunately at this stage and i don't think there's going to be much left it's pretty amazing what hyenas can do a single hyena and now two of them what can do to a nyala carcass in the space of an hour but poor hosana i think that's the end of that i don't think he's going to get anything out of this i'm afraid i'm pretty sure that his kind of carcass is, is going to be pilfered completely. I don't think he's going to be able to steal this back. He might get a little leg or something, but other than that, the more that these two fight with one another and the more that they go at each other, the more that's going to attract others. And I'm pretty sure we're going to start to see the whole clan arriving here fairly shortly. There was a squeal that was left out, let out as the second one arrived, and that meant that, you know, we had... A little bit more noise in the end that will certainly attract the rest of them like i said the den's not that far neither is the last carcass that we had yesterday and so if they're milling about in that area well they're going to hear that and come fairly quickly you can see the that they kind of one is finished almost eating now it's not really interested and there we go you're going to try and drag it away a little bit further amazing the strength even in a small hyena like that to be able to drag it around Yes, now Intima, I thought it might be Intima, I just wanted to double check, but it is Intima, thank you Crystal. I thought it was her, and the way she ran in it looked like her, she was quite dominant over the carcass in some respects, she didn't take any nonsense from Koza at all. So you can see she's now left feeding and Koza's kind of off to the side feeding on little scraps that are down below, but... <sighs> Osana, I'm sorry boy. It's always sad when he loses a kill. I feel so bad for him because he tries so hard. We know how much he stalks and how many animals he chases and how often he tries this. And the fact that he hasn't gotten anything is out of this is a bit of a shame. He didn't even get a feed at least. I was hoping at least if he had gotten a good feed out of it and then lost it, it's one thing. But he didn't really get anything out of it at all. It was one little bite out of the bum. And have you got a leaf stuck to your face, Osana? Look, he's got a leaf stuck to his mouth. It's just not a good day at all. <laughs> Not ideal. Yes, get rid of it. There we go. You don't look as hardcore. It doesn't look as hardcore if you have a leaf stuck to your whiskers, Hosanna. But yes, terrible, terrible day, I'm afraid, for poor Hosanna. He's unfortunately lost his meal. Leaf's, a leaf is sticking to his face and, well, not really going his way, is it? Shame. Oh, well. It's, like I say, the harsh realities of life, and he'll learn from this. 
Teresa, yes, he does look sad, doesn't he? I suppose you would be sad too if you had gone through all the effort to get yourself a... Imagine cooking like a three-course meal, slaving away over a hot stove all day, and then as you prepare it and sit down to eat it, somebody else comes and takes it away from you and eats it right in front of you. It would not be a nice feeling at all. So poor Hosanna is going to have to learn the hard way. And like I said, these are all valuable lessons. As much as it is sad and it doesn't, you know, makes a lot of people kind of hate hyenas. It's not the hyenas' fault. They also are here just to eat and an opportunity presented itself. And Hosanna, like I say, will learn from it. Big animals mean that he's going to lose them. And so he's going to have to figure out how to not take big animals in order to get them up into trees or start getting stronger in order to be able to do it. Now you can see he's not happy. Hyenas are getting closer. Look, 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 look. He's going to try and steal. Oh. No, he's run down into the drainage line. I can't see him at all. Ah, there he is. So he's in a tree on the other side, which is interesting. Okay, let's try and get round and see if we can get to him. I think he'll try and kind of sneak back this way anyway, but let's try get round. David, you're going to have to be a bit careful here. Oh, so am I at this stage. I'm going to get myself into a bit of a jam. But I'm sure he'll end up getting back this side. But poor Hosanna, not ideal. Right, let's get round and try and see if we can figure out a way to actually see Hosanna down below there. It might be actually a good place to go. The way these hyenas are dragging things around, you might actually see this carcass being dragged down into the bottom. And so while we get there, let's send you across to Steve in the Mara and see what he's up to for the rest of the afternoon. Thanks, Tristan. Good luck that side. The topi in the background with some elephants you can see. We have repositioned ourselves as the adult lioness started moving off in a different direction to where the youngsters were. And you can see two of them in picture now. And they have spotted some zebra in the distance that are not being supported by a um, sentry in the form of... Yeah, I know it is very dark. This is as good as we can do, I'm afraid, folks. They're about 100 meters off. And uh, the light does not go that far with the infrared. We do have the lions moving through. Uh, this is what we can see. You can see a few of the youngsters there in the background. And one of the adult lionesses actually come and is looping. She's going to come past our car in a moment. She's right on the road behind us. She's decided she keeps looping. She kept did a big loop around and she's going to come on your left hand side in a moment, James. We just give her a second or two. And she would kind of move and then look in the same direction the others were looking. And this is a very interesting tactic. Here we go, James. She's right here behind you. We might have to do a bit of a spin. Sorry about the big loop around we're doing here, folks. But this lioness has now come all the way around. There she is. And uh, she is doing and it's something that we saw with, when we were using the drone in Juma during the TV series. That the lionesses would actually do this. They'd go and do big loops. We always talk about it, but it's not often that you can actually see it unfolding uh, from the air. And um, so she's probably going to come around and try and frighten all those animals that are in the distance into the waiting sort of uh, ranks of the individuals. They're going to spread themselves out in the open here. And it's a winner. It's a, it's a bit of a uh, uh, you know a gamble because the animals might not run directly to where you want them to. But sometimes they do. But she's done a really big loop going back on herself so as to prevent the animals from seeing her. Not that they had seen her. Always very interesting. Unfortunately, though, folks, this is not an area that we can off-road in. So we're going to have to be able to view it from the road. And if the quality disappears, well, unfortunately, that's the way it is. The other lionesses are still moving off just over here in the distance they're not too far away yeah, well as we see if we can follow up with these guys we might be able to get a bit closer a little bit further they are all still moving forward but Taylor probably got a better position with her cats I'm sure she's got them in much better light Our light is actually just completely gone because the sun has set behind the beautiful Drakensberg mountain range. Shall we have a look, Craig? There's a beautiful vulture too. 
uh, that's going to provide us with the most perfect silhouette. Now, we've got a variety of competitions that will be going on tonight. No, no awards. Please don't get excited other than bragging rights. But uh, shall, uh, we'll get to the poll results in a minute. But I would like to do a sunset challenge. I think it might be a bit late for Steve. I don't know where Tristan is, so we might just win this one, Craig, hands down. Which is also fine, hey? <laughs> but I think that that is also a beautiful and gorgeous. Emma has just shouted, it's rigged. Never. Am I the only one that's showing a sunset this evening? And I can't go without a safari without glancing back to the west. And that is absolutely gorgeous. That is picture perfect. Ah, did you yawn after that vulture yawned? <laughs> That would be bizarre if you did that. <laughs> right. Here we go. Okay, right. So 40% of you said no, it did nothing. Think what? 30, how many? 29% said yes, and 31 said yawn. Something like that? Ah, oh, wonderful. Right, okay, so no wins it, sadly. I yawn sometimes, not all the time, though. Sometimes it does make me have a, have a good stretch of the jaw. Now, um, the lions have been spotted by the Inyala. The Inyala have now moved off. They were barking. If you are watching the dam cam or you have it open in another tab, you may have heard the alarm calls. I'm basically just north of, of the dam. Little, yeah, pretty much just north of the dam. You won't be able to see us, but you definitely would have been able to have heard those Nyala barking. Now, they moved off now, and I'm sure they will go feed somewhere else. Although, it is getting to that time now where the lions are probably going to get active. Well, I'm hoping, I really hope that they're going to get active and do something amazing. Please do something spectacular. Please go now before the buffalo cross out of our boundary, out of our traverse, and then I can't traverse, and then I'm updated. Because if they do kill a buffalo on Bafosok, They'll be there for a little while. There's a yawn. Uh, <laughs> perfect timing. <laughs> I know. I try. Thanks, Emma. Just a couple of them looking up and around. I'm sure they're starting to get the scent of the buffalo now, and hopefully that will encourage these cats to get a move on, but somebody else that's more exhausted than these lions because he's had his kill stolen from him today is Osana. Well, you're good at encouraging people, Taylor, so hopefully you'll be able to encourage the lions to actually start to do something. But Hosanna is longingly looking up at the top of the bank where unfortunately his carcass is being devoured slowly but surely. It's also being covered in sand at this stage. The male causa is just covering it with sand at the moment and kind of kicking it all over the place. I don't know why he's doing it. It's not something that you see hyenas do all that often. And they generally are not too worried. It could be that he's trying not to attract too much attention to it and or he could be going to the toilets. Is he going to the toilet there? Might be that he's going to the toilets. So that's how they do sometimes scent mark. It's by scratching and, and going to the and defecating. It looks like he actually might be defecating at the moment. Yes, he is. I can see his tails in the air there. So he is definitely going to the toilet. So that explains all the dust and sand and scrapings that he's doing. So you often see that from males. They do do it from time to time. And Timo has got the most of the carcass on the backside there. There's no other hyenas that have arrived. We came down into the drainage just in case... Hosanna managed to steal himself a bit of a meal, but he hadn't, unfortunately. He didn't get what he was trying to go after in the form of the stomach content. So for now, he's left just watching as the hyenas devour his carcass on top of the banks of the Mulwati. Sorry, boy. Ivy, you say you still don't like hyenas, but you don't hate them? Well, I know, it's a, it's a bit of a love-hate relationship with hyenas sometimes when they do these kind of things, kind of get a bit annoyed with them but they are incredible animals and, and like I say they're just doing what is natural to them it's the same as the poor Nyala that was living at the start of this game drive that is now not living thanks to the leopard and then you know ultimately the hyenas so you know you can apply it to everything everything's got a 
everything's got to do its business and, and hyenas are just doing what comes naturally. It's not like they are sinister animals that are stealing. And it could have been Tingana that did this. It could have been, you know, lions that would have run in. So it's not just them that are stealing from Hosanna on a day-to-day -day basis. There's others out here doing the same thing. So as much as it's horrible to see and kind of hyenas tend to get the blood boiling a lot more than all of the others, it is part of nature. And poor Hosanna, unfortunately, is not going to be the last kill he loses from these guys. But every time he does, he will start to learn a little bit more about how to not hap let it happen again and how to kind of go about his business and make sure that he keeps his meal to himself as much as possible. But that's going to take time and it's going to take experience. And so, you know, it's all part of growing up. We always forget how young he is at two years and eight months. You know, theoretically, he would just be beginning his journey as an, as an individual leopard, whereas we know he's been doing it for quite some time now. And so he's gaining valuable experience early on in life. And eventually, I think, He's going to, you know, figure it all out and probably find that he won't lose nearly as many as he gets a bit older. Also, as he gets stronger and more developed and physically more powerful, so it's going to become a lot easier for him to hoist carcasses like that and be able to put them up into a tree. I just feel bad for him because he actually did everything right. He dragged it to the nearest tree long before hyenas arrived. He tried to kind of start eating and then, you know, he, he tried to take it up in a tree as the hyenas got here, but unfortunately, it's just too big and too heavy for him at his current size to actually get it right. Also, the tree that he chose in site metrics was a bit awkward for him. If he had had a tree that maybe had a bit of a branch that came out over the drainage line, he would have had a bit more of a sort of go at it. And this particular tree is really not easy to hoist in. The, the, the kind of tree that well, where he can hoist it is so high up, so you'd have to be aiming for somewhere there because this area here, which is where he got to, you can see the bank is too close. If that branch came straight out at us towards the vehicle, then he could have just hopped onto that branch and brought the carcass all the way out, and the hyenas wouldn't have done that, but he would have had to go very, very high. And funny enough, he is not the first leopard that I've seen lose kills at this particular tree. I've seen Tingana lose a kill here, and Tandi's also lost a kill, and Tamba, I think, has also lost a kill at this particular tree as well. So most of them have had a bit of a bad experience. It's a bit deceiving because they drag it there and think they can get up, but it's just unfortunate. It doesn't have any kind of horizontal branches that really work other than way up there, which would have been fine for a Diker or a Steenbok, but not for a massive Nyala, I'm afraid. And so, Hosanna, next time you have to choose a different tree. Now, one is a little bit easier to kind of hoist over, so you'll get it right eventually. It's all, like I say, part of growing up and part of becoming a big leopard. But it still doesn't make it feel any better, does it? I still feel sad for him and wish that he had kept his kill. A lot of hard work goes into stalking a Nyala. It's not easy. We know we've seen him doing how many different Nyala hunts over the past few months, particularly at the dam. He's tried his utmost best to hunt Nyala and never really got it right. And so it's a bit sad that, you know, finally gets a really kind of good deal and gets a nice decent sized one and unfortunately loses out. Anyway, like I say, it's all lessons. Right, now our sun is just setting. Taylor apparently won the sunset challenge, but Steve, unfortunately, has been in the dark for a rather long time, and that means that his lions should theoretically be getting going and potentially beginning to hunt for the evening. Yes, we are in the dark with our infrared as before, and this lioness stalked all the way around us, went into the thickets, scared a few in parlour and then snuck back out again and has come sort of around and back towards where the others are and we're not going to shine any lights uh, she is facing basically the direction where the others were coming from and I'm not sure if there's anything hidden away in the open area here uh, we don't want to give away anything we don't want to shine on any of the animals we are using the infrared so it's completely uh, non-intrusive uh, to predator and prey alike and I do apologize for the quality we are a good 60 odd yards from this lion at the moment lioness and she's looking into the darkness trying to find themselves some dinner they were looking very hungry the pride and the impala that alarm called quickly made an exit and she bypassed it she's not going to go try catch an impala that's alert and off she goes again so she's now walking sort of parallel to where her sisters are or her sisters would hit her perpendicular if they came directly straight so she must have seen something in that general area that she wanted to try and spook 
and as we looked behind us we could see the eyes of the youngsters and the other adults slowly moving up but she is moving a little bit too far out of the way so that is the way it works such a folks we are as I said not in the off-road driving area it's a little bit further to the west but uh, or south anyway I'm still learning but in this area we can't do so so don't forget this is interactive folks and this is my first proper lion hunt out in the Masamara so drop us any questions or comments what do you think of this very low light quality activity of lions hunting in the darkness I think it's just a little bit of a build up to what we will be seeing in the coming weeks no doubt when we can spend time with the sausages and whatever else out there in the middle of nowhere I'm excited to see that so I think she's departed a little bit further on we're not going to be able to see her unfortunately there is a road just behind here I'm going to go back onto that one to see if maybe we can catch up with the rest of the pride that's maybe a little bit closer to it I'm just scanning real quick with the infrared nothing there doesn't go very far the light unfortunately we do really need that FLIR camera up here, then things would be fantastic. I'm sure James would like to work with it as well. Okay, well let's turn around. James, shall we head back to that other road that we had? Just a quick scan. There are some animals over there. Can't make out what though, just a little... Am I okay to come back there, James? It is pitch black, and unlike the Juma vehicles, you can't see behind you at all with these guys. With an enormous roof on the back. Or on the top, should I say. It covers the back. Keeps the rain out. As we do know, it does get rather rather wet up here. Okay, well, let's come around onto the other side and see if we can catch up at least with those little youngsters in the infrared from a, a more decent distance than what we have been seeing. So we've got to play by the roads in this particular area. It is very tempting to, to drive off there, but you've got to play by the rules, ladies and gentlemen. That is the way it works. There are areas where we can access with our off-road permit, but this is not one of them. And we're talking about an animal that we often spend time with off-road. Tristan is with... We are indeed. We're still sitting with our boy who is now starting to actually fall asleep now. He's I think, kind of taking it a bit easy. Hyenas are feeding up on the top. There's really not much that's taking place now. I think poor Hosanna has realized that he's not really going to get much back of this for now. He's going to have to wait and you can see he's flopping down. Which means that I'm going to throw out a decision to all of you. We can either carry on sitting here and see what happens and whether or not Osana gets his kill back when, and the hyenas leave, or we can roll the dice and maybe head back up towards that carcass at Buffalswick Dam and see if we can get a glimpse of the mysterious leopard up that side. So you guys need to let me know, hashtag Safari Live or at FC on the YouTube chat. Let me know what you think, what you want to do. I, I suspect Osana might get something back of this kill. I don't think it will be much. I, I've the amounts of kind of that those hyenas have eaten and the fact that there's now two of them means that he's not going to challenge while there was still one i was hopeful now that there's two not so much and i'm pretty sure more are going to arrive it's starting to get dark now the noise of them eating is quite loud actually and so i think he's going to unfortunately lose out a little bit he's just popped his head up now what have you heard hosanna maybe another hyena arriving up on the top there could be nope doesn't seem like i can see what it is it's Kind of popped his head up as though he heard something or saw something, but I don't see anything. It's tricky where we are because the carcass is up on the bank. You can just hear them feeding away and eating. So now I honestly don't think we're going to see too much more of anything from these guys at this stage. So, right. I think I'm going to make the executive decision as to where we're going to go. I'm going to think about it for the next two minutes and then decide where I'm going to head. While I do that, though, let's send you back across to the Nkuma Pride with Taylor Makarudi. I'm so sorry that Cameron's going to shake because I'm putting on my jersey. I should have done it earlier. So now I'm trying to pull it down. 
fairy. I think I may have even put it on the wrong way. Oh well, we'll just go with it today. Here's the lions starting to sort of wake up, but uh, don't let them fool you just yet. The Ngahumas have the habit of yawning and rolling around and grooming themselves and then going back to sleep. So uh, they might still do that. I'm just shuffling a whole thing, a few things around now after I've got my jersey on. It's much toastier now. Although it's not particularly cold anyways, it's just uh, the temperature has dropped by about maybe four or five degrees Celsius, which means that I'll have to put a scarf and a beanie on soon. And of course, as you've noticed, we've gone into infrared. For all those new viewers out there who don't know what infrared is, um, it's our IR light. And uh, basically these cats, or well, any of the animals can't see this light. And it allows us to film them basically uh, without having to shine a spotlight. So we use our spotlight still, just to spot animals and then once we've located them then we switch to infrared so it's a much better way to approach animals when they're hunting uh, unfortunately if you're going to come on a safari it's it's impossible for you to all enjoy the wonders of inf infrared otherwise you wouldn't be able to see anything oh bless you everyone got a fright um i do that often actually my dad does that to me when he sneezes actually when he sneezes in johannesburg i still get a fright here on the sabi sand it's so loud so it kind of causes vibrations and people, re you know, report earthquakes and things like that. It's, it's unnecessarily loud. Rudin, no, I, I don't, I can't say that I get scared filming in the dark. Uh, the only time I have been terrified is, well, hey Craig, shall we reminisce about our times of the stampeding wildebeest across <laughs> Masai Mara? Craig and I had some horrific experiences with uh, wildebeest stampeding towards us, but thousands and thousands of them. So that's a little bit daunting. There's my pet cat just coming up to say hello. No, not really, but coming right up to the car. So you can kind of see where that infrared light is more prominent. You see how it gets brighter? But again, there's no artificial... Well, I'm not shining a spotlight on us. Thank you. Thank you, lion. That's great. Oh, it's Amber Eyes. Bye, Amber Eyes. She's just going behind the car, just out of view, but there's more lines on their way, so that's nice. Here comes the next one. Hello. I love the way they walk. Pretty epic how close they come. Carla, you said hello, kitty. And no, we're not talking about the brand. We're talking about these cats. I'm just stretching out. What have you got? You found yourself a bit of a stuff. Is it buffalo dung? It looked like Emma and I today as we were doing our workout. Although she was a lot more graceful. Ah, <laughs> oh, snap. You owe me a coke. There's a delay. But as I said, what I said, Emma got it in final control. Ah, oh, that was funny. There we go. Thank you, kitty cats. It was about time that you all woke up. It's at that, at that hour, except it's not golden light anymore like I asked them to wake up. Oh well. A bit late than ever. If you guys can just get a move on now and go and catch a buffalo, that'd be great. We're all waiting. And we've only got like 20 minutes of the show left. I hope you know, lions. You can see they're looking lean. Bless you. Now that sound of them walking past the car as they drag their feast during the, uh, in, not during, in the grass. Look at them, they're all coming to say hello, la lions. This is pretty spectacular. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I can only see thirteen lions right now. They're all just walking, fundling past us slowly. But maybe I've missed one just laying off. Who's missing? Here's the Ngohuma boy. And comes the next lot. Some contact calling going on behind us. All just walking one by one. Bobby, yes, best I'll be careful that the lions don't take my shoes. I need them more than they do. They've got this awesome padding under their feet. 
and and also thorns bother them sometimes, but they'll hurt me a lot more than they hurt the lions. I need my shoes. It's also nice to see the Mangani boys getting better, getting better, getting ready at the back there. Also doing some yawning and stretching. Ooh. Now it seems as though the lions in the Mara are one step ahead of the Nguhumas. They've found themselves a nice mm, little vantage point. And I think they're scouting out and searching for dinner. Oh, sorry everybody, it seems as though I, I was having a conversation there, um, apologies for that. Uh, so it seems as though Steve has lost his audio. It's not very often that we lose our voices. So the three lions that are hanging at the back are the Talamati male and then the uh, two Mangani boys. So they're just keeping their distance for the moment. But we need to keep up with the front of, I almost said the front of the herd. But lions don't roam in herds, they live in prides. I don't know why we say ridiculous things like that. Okay. Right, so now here comes the fun part. Where are my lights? Lost them. Okay. Well, we're going to try again. We're going to navigate through this Terminalia forest as well as all the Maruda trees trying to drive into them. Follow the lions. Let's go back to Steve and give him a second chance at showing you those big cats. Sorry about the gremlins, folks. And the lions, we have managed to catch up with them, and indeed they're one step ahead of the Unkuhumas due to the fact that the sun sets a little bit earlier here in the Mara at this time of year. Well, not normal, not, not earlier than it does in the Mara, but earlier than it does in Juma. So the alarm clock was set earlier for these cats, and they're up and mobile. And it's interesting, you can just see in the top left of the corner, there's some a little bit of a, of a shine. That's one of the adults... And in the front here is three of the youngsters. They've done a whole big loop. Not a loop, but a bit of a U-bend. And they are now positioned pretty much where they originally, that a topi that was watching them, was looking at them from. So I'm not sure exactly what they've spotted. We're just watching very passively using the infrared, as Taylor rightfully says. It's very inobtrusive. And I have to look at the monitor. I cannot look towards the lines because it is pitch black. And the lions are able to see what's going on in the pitch darkness, which does always make it a little bit scary. Yes, indeed, crazy lady or crazy legs. I'm not sure what your name was there, sorry. But the eyes in the distance are a little bit creepy. And uh, that is with infrared light, folks. Can you imagine you'd just be walking along here in the grassland and there's a whole pride of lions lying up and waiting for you. Yeah, that is definitely why we are not nocturnal. We are diurnal. We needed fire to survive through the night because hunting and gathering in the night time, well, we've got no chance against these guys. In the night time, they come into their own element. In daytime, they're normally a little bit shy and sort of tend to back away from human presence. At night time, a very different kettle of fish. I really wonder where that saying comes from. Kettle of fish. Very interesting anyway. Our sighting is quite dark. The animals seem to be settling down a little bit. But let's go back to the Unkuhumas who I'm sure are going to put on a show. Sorry everybody, I'm just going to excuse myself now. I'm not going to be able to look back at any of you as I'm off-roading through quite a... A hectic spot. I've also just noticed some. Look at my hair. Why does it do that? I don't know why I've become a crowned crane. Anyways, I'm trying to get ahead of the lions and get to the back of the buffalo herd. But I, so I'm navigating through this thicket at the moment. So I do apologise, but I don't want to drive through any stumps. I don't want to fall into any holes like that. Look at that. Look at that massive. Oh, it's not that big. I wouldn't want to fall in there. So, just concentrating hardcore here. 
Well, Taylor, we've got the most relaxed bush baby ever. Now, of course, it's going to jump because it's been sitting grooming itself for a few minutes and then decided now it's going to move. There is actually two in this particular section. So there's one that's on this kind of right side that you can just maybe make out in the background moving around. There it is. Isn't that cool? There's a little lesser galago is what it's called. And they are awesome little creatures. I love these guys. And we don't get to see them all that regularly because of unfortunately being the nocturnal creatures that they are and the fact that we often finish just before dark kind of takes hold and so you know it's, it's not an animal that we get to see all that often but now's the best time of the year to see them because it's so thin and with the, the leaves all missing it's really easy to actually find them and so you get these crazy side things and check how relaxed this guy is that's amazing so he's just sitting grooming himself or herself difficult to say whether it's male or female from this distance but really really cool you can see big eyes big ears typical of nocturnal creatures and then those amazing prehensile thumbs that they've got on their feet and big back legs that are filled with muscle that allows them to push themselves off and go off in a crazy kind of jump that is much much bigger than any of us could jump in relative to their body size it really is quite cool to see how much these guys can jump and how far they can it's like the explosive little one there's the other one you see the other one's just coming from the bottom Michelle, you say you love the fingers? Yes, the fingers are very, very cool, aren't they? Now you can see two in one frame. Not often we get two bush babies in the same kind of picture. So that's very, very cool in its own right as well. And the fingers are amazing and they're kind of quite sticky. They urinate on the fingers. Oh, they've gone together, look. So they're grooming each other. How cool is this? <laughs> it really isn't that often that we get to see these guys as relaxed as this and particularly grooming one another together. This is absolutely amazing very very cool now i know some of you didn't want me to leave hosanna but i'll take this as a good sign for leaving hosanna for now we were trying to see if we could maybe get to that carcass to try and see if we could maybe get lucky with that leopard but this is a really good sighting in its own right that's for sure very very cool yes a little bit of bush baby yoga as it grooms its foot very cool that's amazing so so cool right well if we're going to try and get to that leopard we're going to have to leave fairly shortly now paula actually thinking about it have forgotten really how long bush babies live i for some reason it's kind of gone out of my mind i, I used to know these things but i haven't seen bush babies in so long or chatted about them that i've drawn a blank to be honest getting old guys you can see all the gray hair it's making me but talk to me i'll get it eventually i want to say sort of about it i'm completely blank at this stage it'll come to me just now though i'm pretty sure about it. now it sounds like I've got a bad signal, but the signal should come back because I'm much higher now than I was. But in the meantime, I'm going to send you across to Steve anyway in the hope that you guys still have me and that you can get across to Steve and those lions are still going through the darkness with those glowing eyes. Yes, well, we just had one of the lionesses chasing a wildebeest that was kind of moving towards us and she nearly got it just in front, uh, but the, the visual with the light is not great I'm afraid folks so we're going to be moving around onto the other road they've all started moving back towards where we originally saw them well on that same sort of road who knows we might be able to catch up with them that is on our way out of this area as well I do believe I could be mistaken but who knows if we get lost out here well it's fantastic we've got snacks and juice and well it's not that cold it's fantastic I came prepared you all know me well maybe some of you don't but i like to wear lots and lots of layers because i get cold and so i think that's why my bag weighed too much when i came so i think my bag weighed too much because of all the warm clothes i brought but it was completely unneeded at the moment so far maybe there'll be some colder spells in the evening but it's quite pleasant a nice spring evening you would say in down in juma I'm trying not to hit all of the bumps along the way. Sorry about that. It is a very bumpy road. But that was very cool to spend some time on my first night drive, second night drive. Ooh, well, 
magic dragon was that you know what I saw last night? You want to know what my favorite animal is up here. But I saw a serval yesterday, which was very, very cool. Um, the Ascari myself a few minutes to be able to see the thing moving through the long grass, which was very special. And shortly, whoa, that is an enormous hole. I'm so glad, James, that I didn't hit that hole. That would have been the end of James. We wouldn't want that, would we? We've only just met. So, serval was very cool. Um, I'm trying to think what other animals we might find up here. That are we, There's a black rhino up here, and we don't see them in Juma, although they do occur in the Kruger Park. And we will be able to show you some, which is fantastic. I'll we'll find you a rhino, and we'll be able to talk about it, and put it on screen, and maybe find you some rhino dung, and talk about the ins and outs of black rhino poo. We'll do a little bit of a poo story on the black rhino. I'm game. I'm game. But I'm trying to think what else there might be. Uh, Scott apparently saw pangolin not so long ago. You do get them in Juma, but it doesn't matter where you see a pangolin. It's always special. Uh, but the things I'm really looking forward to is just increasing my birding list because there are a lot of birds up here that you don't find down south. So that is something I'm looking forward to, to showing you. Or even if I just see it myself, either or, I'd love to show you as well. But we don't always get to capture the birds and show you live. We, we'll be spending some time out here non-live as everything is so far away. We're going to spend quite a bit of time stopping and starting. And uh, James, I'm sure, is going to develop some patience with me and my birding. He told me yesterday that he doesn't mind. Okay, so here we are back to where we originally found those lions. And it's not uncommon for them to go in circles. I think it's one of their tactics to try and confuse the prey. Let's go in a circle, they'll never guess. <laughs> and uh, then suddenly they pop out where they originally were. Because the animals will be like, no, the lions are here. That's why we can smell them. They can't be back. But anyway, we might pop into the lions again in a second. But in the meantime, let's go back to Taylor, who I think is searching for the Unkuhumas that have gone missing. Sorry about the bumps. I had to give up following the lions through the block because it was just too hectic. So, uh, just checking. The buffalo have definitely crossed over the fire break, which is what we're driving on at the moment. The lions are coming this way. I can't actually even see the buffalo. So they've gone into Biffle's Hook. So we will eventually lose the cats because it's exactly what these cats are doing is that they're on the trail. Sorry, my hair is now stuck into my necklace. That's so much fun. Love it when that happens. So the lions are just pretty much going to follow the buffalo and head. Whoa, let's very quickly go to Tristan. So we've managed to find the leopardies here, which is amazing. Now, I'm not 100% sure who it is just yet. He's sitting far from us at the moment. We're having to use a spotlight, unfortunately, because our infrared will just not reach that far at all. And so we wanted to just get a view because you can see, look how far away we are. He's sitting very comfortably at the moment. He's not moving too much. And so I'm just letting him, giving him time to relax. But it paid off to come back at night to be able to find him. So how amazing. That's so cool. Now I'm going to try and creep a little bit closer. Hopefully some of you will be able to ID him. It looks like Mfukazi to me, potentially. It's so far away though. I can't see with my naked eye. I just have to look at the camera screen. King Quad, you agree? You say it looks like Mfukazi. It looks like it's got that notch out of the right ear and that damaged right eye. Let's try and get a little closer. He looks quite relaxed. I'm just going to take the spotlight off while we get a little closer. But how cool. It's amazing. So we, a bit of patience and perseverance has actually paid off in some respects. Now don't move, boy. I want to just see. He looks very relaxed under the cover of darkness. No, there he goes. He's up and moving, so we can't get any closer to him. Now, hopefully some of you will be able to tell me whether or not it is him, but that is very cool. He was very relaxed. He wasn't moving too much, and now that you see, look, when we switch off, he's okay. So this is just a process that you'd have to do. I think it's, you know, much like what happened last time we saw him. It's just a slow, slow, steady. We'd have to probably sit for quite some time and work out whether or not he'll be comfortable with us before we can get going. But at least we got a glimpse of this ghost that was here and which leopard this actually is. Now, this explains a lot to me. So it might mean it's kind of 
it might be a funny thing that he's here, but it explains why Tundi's movement in the last two days has been so extreme. I have a funny feeling that this leopard has been in this area, and this is where Tundi came from. Let's not forget that Tundi ran in this area, and she ran to Bifulzuk Dam and then carried on all the way to the west where she hid Trolamba. And I wonder if it's not because this male was maybe coming from where he had his carcass with Tingana and across. It looks like him. I mean, I would hope that everybody can kind of... Con firm or deny whether it is Mfukazi, but it does look just like him. Now I'm a bit sad that he moved. We kind of were right at the right point where I would have liked to have stopped, but either way, that was absolutely worth coming and having a little look. So we'll try to see if we can get another little glimpse at him. In the meantime, let's send you back across to Taylor and see what she's going to be up to. <laughs> Right, I think, Emma, please may we very quickly go into the thermal, the FLIR, and have a look at the lines. There you go, we've doing got one a line doing somersault. a somersault. Everybody, everybody, there we go, in the thermal camera now. So we've managed to catch up with the lines. We're right on the fire break now, so we're close to Bivelzook boundary, and we've seen where... Obviously, the, all the buffalo have uh, crossed over. Oh, there they go. Isn't that incredible? I think that Fleur image is just amazing. It's really quite special, really quite something to watch them moving uh, sort of through the trees like that. Very, very dramatic. Wonderful. Let's go back into, I think, infrared now, just because they're about to come out onto the road and there's another vehicle. There we go. Wonderful. Well, that's exciting. So the lions are going to probably walk right in front of our car. One is already past us. So here come the others now. Oh, they're contact calling. There's another vehicle there. I wonder why they're contact calling. That's interesting. Maybe they're trying to catch up with Amber Eyes because she was leading everybody towards the buffalo this evening. She does seem to be quite a dominant female. Her and that young and Kuhuma lioness, well, one of the, uh, the older, older ones, um, they always used to stick together and often go off hunting. But in a very exciting afternoon it has been, I'm sure you've all been sitting at the edge of your seats with lions from the Mara and of course the Nkuhuma Pride after tracking them all morning long and then Hosanna of course appearing in the show. It wouldn't be a sunset safari without him. But thank you very much. Join us again tomorrow. Keep an eye out or an ear out.